and I'm waiting for confirmation that the meeting is actually recording. <coughs> and I have that confirmation now. So I'll now take this adherent for the meeting of the Executive Committee of the 3rd of November 2021. Councillor Allison, I see that you're here. Um, Councillor Anderson is also here. Councillor Bradley is here. I have apologies from Councillor Brown. Councillor McGeever, can you confirm that you are substituting for Councillor Brown and are in attendance? Yes, happy to do so, thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Chalmers, I see that you're here. Councillor Convery. Here, Pauline. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Nothing from Councillor Cooper. Councillor Corbett. Sorry, Councillor Corbett is an apology. Um, Councillor Ian Harrow is covering for Councillor Corbett this morning, but he hasn't got the link. If somebody could send him the link, please. Karen, could you do that, please? Uh, but we'll get uh, we'll get a link sent to um, Councillor Harrow. If you just thank bear you, with us. we'll do that just now. Just if you, as I say, if you just bear with us. Okay, that's been done. Um, we'll just wait for Councillor Harrow to come in and we'll check with him in a minute. Um, back to Teams. Um, so, apologies from Councillor Corbett. Councillor Craig, I see that you're at the meeting, as is Councillor Devlin, Councillor Dorman and Councillor Fagan. Councillor Faulkner is also at the meeting, as is Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Horsham is at the meeting, as is Councillor Logan, Councillor Loudon, Councillor Lowe. Nothing from Councillor Lowe. No. Nope. Councillor McAdams. Yeah, Pauline. Thank you. Councillor McGuigan. Nothing from Councillor McGuigan. Councillor McCreary, I see that you're at the meeting. Councillor Miller is also at the meeting, as is Councillor Nealon. Councillor Nelson, are you at the meeting? No, nope, nothing. Councillor Nelson, I see that you are at the meeting. Could you? Yes, yeah, sorry, I couldn't get off mute. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm here. Not a problem, thank you. Councillor Ross is at the meeting. Councillor Shearer is at the meeting. Um, I have apologies from Councillor Wardhall. Councillor Watson, can you confirm that you're substituting for Councillor Wardhall and are at the meeting? I'm substituting and I'm at the meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Wilson. I'm here, Polly. Thank you. And there are a number of officers also present at the meeting. So with that, Chair, I'll hand back to you for the business of the meeting. Uh, thanks very much, Pauline, and very warm welcome to everyone uh, to this morning's executive meeting. Uh, we'll start with item one, which is a declaration of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest? Uh, Chair, I do. It's item eight, and I refer members to my register of interest. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maureen. We'll get to you to leave the meeting at that point in time or get Pauline to run through it with you at that present time. OK, thanks very much. Uh, move on to, I don't see any other hands raised, so I'll take it there's no more declarations of interest. We'll go on to uh, item two, uh, which is the uh, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, do we have any colleague has anything to raise in the minutes of the previous meeting? I don't see any hands raised, so... I'm going to move that it's a correct minute. Sorry, Chair, I'll second. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go on to uh, item three, uh, which is a monitoring item. It's a revenue budget monitoring for period six. Uh, and I would ask uh, Paul to come in and give a report on this, please. Great. Thanks, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the, the revenue budget monitoring paper, and it takes us 
from the start of the financial year through to the 10th of September. Now, it follows the format that we've taken to using across the past year to 18 months over the period of the pandemic. And it does look in, at length at the position that we anticipate seeing in terms of spend in relation to COVID costs for 2021-22. So at section 5.1, you can see uh, some revisions in there to our estimate of what we expect to spend in relation to COVID to the end of the financial year. Now, that's identifying additional costs in relation to education resources and with our social work resources, both in relation to costs associated with children and families. And this is an area that we've referred to in previous committee reports. We did say to the last meeting that what we would do was to look at uh, updating the position and seeing the extent to which the costs were attributable to COVID. So that's been done and the, the, the level of increase that we're saying we believe we can attribute to COVID is covered in that section at 5.1 and it says there the value is increasing from 1.4 to just under 2.4 million pounds. Uh, the point is also made at the end of that paragraph that this appears to be an issue which is occurring across Scotland and it also uh, gives an estimate in terms of the costs which could carry on into year 2022-23 that we're, we're seeing in 2021-22. So there's likely to be a residual impact of that and I'll come back to that later on in the paper because that's a factor as well in terms of broader social care costs. There's also an update given at 5.2 in respect of the figures for South Lanarkshire Leisure and Culture. And there's a revision there to, to the estimate uh, that we expect to, to see by the end of the year. So there's a revised position there of £3.9 million pounds in comparison to the previous position, which was 5.4. So that area has come down. Now, between those two factors, at 5.4, we can see an overall movement in our anticipated spend this year in relation to COVID costs. And previously, uh, we were reporting just under £18.2 million. Because of these movements that I've just described, that's now sitting at £18.65 million to the end of the year. And there's content in that paragraph as well about how that is going to be funded. Now, the paper then moves to look at, and this is from section 5.7 onwards, social care costs. Now, the, the first thing I would say there, and this has been noted in previous reports, that these social care costs for year 2021-22 are currently being picked up through what's called the mobilisation plan. So this is a route through which we're recovering money from the government via the NHS and we're able to charge our COVID costs uh, to that route of funding. So for year 2021-22, these don't represent a financial burden on the council. But going back to the point I made a moment ago, we need to be conscious of the impact that these could have in future years. And that's something that's referred to in this paper. So section 5.8 talks about pressures that are uh, being observed in terms of the care at home service. And there's a reference at the beginning at 5.9, uh, and, and this refers to content that we've had in, in, in the last couple of reports about unmet need and recruitment to try and deal with that. And as it says there, in terms of recruitment for care at home staffing, that's been authorised to be funded by the mobilisation plan in year 21-22 at a cost of up to £1.9 million. We also refer in there to interim care home placements, and there's a value of £1.5 million given against them. Now, one thing that has occurred since we last reported, and this is again covered in section 5.9 in your paper, is around additional funding announced by the Scottish Government. And this, you'll uh, no doubt have seen covered in the media referred to as winter planning funding. So there's a national total of £300 million. I think at this point, we've still to be uh, informed of our allocation of those funds. And that's been discussed with the Chief Officer and the Chief Financial Officer 
of the Integration Joint Board and they've committed to taking an update uh, to the next IGB board meeting covering the position, the recurring funding and the extent of any remaining exposure and in turn I'll report that to a future executive committee. So a development there. So if I can go back to the recommendations, it's asking that you note the overspend position which is £120,000 on the, the general fund account. There's also uh, the second recommendation there, uh, the total net expenditure at that point at the 10th of September, that's covered in the paper. The updated COVID position for 2021-22, which I took you through in a fair bit of detail there, and also an anticipated break-even position on the housing revenue account. So those are the recommendations, Chair, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. Um, I'll open up uh, to colleagues to see if anyone has any comments. Um, John Anderson, see your hands up. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'd just like to ask Paul, given the unprecedented uh, increase in fuel, uh, diesel is now the highest ever in some places, and the cost of gas and electricity has uh, shot up quite a bit. How is that going to impact on my finances going forward? As it seems to be the case that these things are going to continue to continue to rise, and it's uh, rising by quite a bit. Thanks very much, John. Paul? OK, thanks, Councillor Anderson. Well, just to, to, to pick up on your question, right, this is likely to result in increased costs, but moving forward. Right, so in the current year, uh, we participate in a contract for utilities for gas and electricity through Procurement Scotland. Right, so there is a degree to which, in the main, that cost is locked in for 2021-22. So what happens is through Procurement Scotland, uh, gas and electricity are purchased in advance. So that gives us a, a degree of protection right, from fluctuations like the ones that you've seen across the past few months. But moving forward, we're going to need to look at that as part of our budget strategy, because if the costs are rising, you're right, it will cost more. Okay, thank Thanks. You, Paul. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, that's uh, good to know that at least we're locked into something to the end of the year. Um, I see that uh, Mark McGeever, Mark. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I, I was noticed that on the kind of section of paragraph 5.9 on page 15, uh, um, it's kind of relating to bed blocking and delayed discharge, which is obviously a very pertinent issue. And if, if we look at page 59 of the subsequent Connect report, um, it seems as though South Lanarkshire is kind of significantly below the Scottish average or failing to meet the Scottish average in terms of getting people who are clinically fit enough to be home home. Um, and I'm wondering, given the, the situation, this, this report is obviously about, to some extent about forward planning and, and kind of future spend and how we can make a difference in the medium to long term. But the crisis at NHS hospitals about being in a, a level black situation is obviously immediate. And I'm wondering if there's any revenue implications for spending that we can urgently um, allocate and that, that would relieve some of the stress that, with, without looking to apportion blame or, or sound negative, that to an extent our failure to meet that, the targets that we'd set ourselves is causing the NHS. Um, I mean, some of the, the reports, as you'll know, I mean, as a lot of you know, I'm kind of I kind of hear a lot about this from hospital doctors um, that are kind of close to me and um, the stress they're under is absolutely massive and, and they're very clear that the huge proportion of the problem at the moment is not actually COVID cases themselves but it's the, the delayed discharges that are causing a, a backlog. They can't get patients off wards, um, they can't find beds for new patients coming in and with A&E being as busy as it is it's leading to many many hours of backlogging and there's a report out the other day that said as many as I think it was something like 231 excess deaths in Scotland directly attributable they think to, to delays because of that situation so like I say I'm wondering if there's any financial um, means that we can allocate now to help resolve this thanks uh, thanks Mark uh, obviously a lot of, an awful lot of what you said uh, relating to uh, an item six in the, the, the report, but I'll see if Paul can give an answer to that at this present time. Uh, Paul? 
Listen, Chef, I'm happy to give an answer in, in as much as I can. I notice Suman's got his hand up. See, so, yeah, I see Suman. Would it be better if Suman come in in this first ball? Well, what I was going to suggest, right, part of what Councillor McGee was talking about is in the context of this paper, right, and obviously around money spent. So I can take it up to a point and then hand over to Suman. Okay. Just, I, I suppose picking up in Councillor McGeever's uh, point around something, you know, part of the content of this paper being forward looking, part, part of it is, right, but I suppose part of the issue with this paper is there is that much going on that I admit I'm putting everything plus the kitchen sink in front of you. So the bit that I think you're talking about is actually about money that we've spent and action that we're, we're taking. So just given this un, unprecedented situation and you know, some of the routes that are open to us in terms of funding uh, activity, the point that's being made there is, look, we have acted. People have been taken on as far as we can, right, and it's incurring cost. And then I think we come, Councillor McGee, to the point that you're looking at that starts to cast its eye ahead and say, OK, what does this mean moving forward? So, you know, I, I definitely don't want to give the impression that action isn't being undertaken. Part of the issue here, though, isn't about money, right? It's about the, the capacity that's out there in terms of getting people into the system in order to provide the service that's, that's absolutely required. So maybe at that point, it, it's, a, it's a neat opportunity to, to bring in Suman. Chair, thank you. Uh, thanks, Paul. Suman? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so to build on that point from uh, what's been said already, so there's a few elements I'd want to highlight. One, in terms of, there's obviously a real challenge around delay discharge, and uh, I've reviewed the numbers daily in respect to that. It's important to note two things. Firstly, in terms of actually our delayed discharge performance within South Lancashire, it's actually improved quite markedly from what it was two years ago. So we've actually seen, a, a, the, so the staff are working incredibly hard. So the numbers are still higher, much higher than we would like, but there's been considerable improvement through sustained action, something within this authority, and indeed our colleagues in North Lancashire over the last 18 months. And it's certainly something that's very important to me to kind of quite emphasise repeatedly because I think it's, it, that acknowledges the really hard work of staff across the totality of our system, both in our hospitals and critically our community and, and social care staff. So that's number one. Number two, though, and it speaks to your point around what's creating the current pressures. And in fairness, Council, is, there's a number of factors at play. So the lead issues is one aspect of this stuff. But in truth, there's also a number of other things around how the system's operating under a huge degree of stress at the moment. Uh, so if you were speaking to one of our district nurses, or if you were speaking to one of our social workers, they might give you a different complexion on where some of the pressures arise. What we can say is that as a consequence, partly of what's happened over the last 18 months, uh, we have what's got, we're referring to as incubating needs. So we've got a huge degree of demand across the totality of our services. And one of our challenges for a health and care system isn't that it's not to do with a, a block in what any given point. Um, and I appreciate that it can often be a struggle for colleagues who work within a particular area because they just see what's right in front of them. But actually, if you look across the totality of, if you like, the pipeline that we, where we're moving people in and out, it's all running hot, as we would say. So we're seeing an increasing level of demand, increasing level of complexity uh, that's really putting the system under strain. Now, as for many parts of Scotland, and uh, dare I say all parts of Scotland, there is a need for us to radically do how we provide health and care differently. And that's been in the offering for the better part of a decade now, uh, and that presents challenges locally as well as nationally in some of the public discourse around that. Most of those things we can't turn off overnight. Uh, one of the things that's something I've been very reassured about in terms of what we're doing in South Lanarkshire, though, is that we are, as Paul says, really pulling at the stops. The main determining factor here in terms of our ability to respond, in fairness, both within our hospitals, but also in our community health and care services, are about the availability of a workforce, as Paul has talked about there. So we can't knit people. Uh, we are working very hard to bring new people into the workforce. It's really important for me, as I know it is for Cleland and the, exec the senior team, that we really promote social care as an exciting and fulfilling place to work. So the messaging here is really important. It's also important that we highlight the skills required to do this well and the fact we want the quote unquote the right people with the right kind of commitment, compassion coming into this work. So we need to recognise that, that that presents again a challenge in terms of us being able to bring people in rapidly because we do need to get people who have got the right mindset and can are willing to work and learn in terms of doing that. I'm really pleased with the support we're getting from our HR colleagues. We're working really hard in terms of the offer we put out to different parts of our communities to make it attractive. 
and again we've got ongoing work in that regard but it's but there are no first there's no rapid you know easy wins here there are no magic bullets and as Paul's paper highlights the real challenge for this council as indeed others is around that recurring commitment uh, both because in terms of making these attractive posts for people to come into they need to be recurring they need to be permanent posts rather than something which is temporary given, again not least given the commitment required from people in terms of learning development and training but also the fact that these pressures are not going to go away after the winter. They will change, um, but in terms of the, the, the level of complexity and demand where our staff are having to contend with across the piece, uh, this will be going on past the spring for certain. And my last point to highlight, and again, it speaks to some of that point around the delay discharge, it's really important to recognise that the majority of the pressure on our care home and, uh, and care at home packages are very much a bit from the community. So if we look nationally for every one you know, kind of request for package from acute services, we have nine that come out from our community services. So just increasing the capacity with the community doesn't solve the hospital pressures because actually we're looking at pressures across the piece. Uh, one of the things that so I, I, I hope you like to members will find helpful though, is we do have the session on the 19th that will allow us to present all of this in the round and I hope we'll give you a better sense of the complexity of what we're looking at. Because as I hope I've articulated, sometimes honing in one particular datum here in one particular metric doesn't necessarily give you the full picture that you're looking for. I hope that you found that helpful. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Shimon. Uh, are you OK with that at this present time, Mark? You're on mute. Yeah, I am, and uh, thanks for the answer. I, I just want to add something very quickly. I think it's probably pertinent, is that I noticed recently there was some criticism of South Lanarkshire Council in, in some of the, the press for um, actively trying to recruit um, staff and sideways moves into social care. And I just want to say I thought that was very unfair um, because for me, I think it does reflect that we we do have a problem that, and that seems to me to be trying to fill an immediate need. And and I think it's important to get on record that, you know, if it, so long as that we are encouraging people to come over with the right skill set and then training them up properly before they go out and actually have any uh, um, care role, then I, then I think that's the right thing to do. Um, and I, I just wanted to mention that given, at this time. Um, I, I do appreciate that, you know, this is a, a kind of complex issue and, and like everything in the NHS as well, actually, there's no single uh, silver bullet that will resolve it. I, I think the long term, I'm, gl I'm glad to hear that, you know, they've identified that this is not going to be something that can be um, relied upon to, to go away uh, and that there'll be a, a long term view in that. But I do hope if the NHS is coming forward and at any point saying that, you know, we need to get people off of wards who are clinically fit to go home, then I, then I would hope that the council could potentially try and leave no stone unturned to find money and resources that would facilitate that. Um, you know, to be very clear, we're talking about people who are fit and well, and the longer they stay on a hospital ward, the, the more prone they are to infection, the more vulnerable they are to negative outcomes, to long term problems. And I think it's in, we all acknowledge that it's in their interest to get home. That's where they want to be. Uh, and anything we can do as a council to facilitate that, I would hope we would be looking to do. Thanks, John. Hey, thanks, Mark. And I'm glad you did mention uh, the situation there with the recruitment. Uh, I think uh, the council were very quick to put out a statement saying that there's no way they would consider anybody for the job unless they were ad adequately trained. So thanks very much for mentioning that. Uh, I see that I have Monique with her hand up. Monique? Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I, my, I echo everything that Mark uh, has said. So, I mean, it was just some, and, and John, I also agree with what you said as well. I do think it was unfair, that email. I think it was sensational journalism, and I don't think it helps anything because, you know, this is a, it, it was a human story and it was it was about actually helping, you know, um, relieve pressures on a service that all of us have family members or friends or, you know, community neighbours. So it, it wasn't a helpful um, story. Um, one thing I did say, though, was it would be good to know if the triple A qualification that is needed, whether that is going to be covered by the council or those same people would also need to pay for the qualification the way the carers do. And I've asked that question before and I would like that answered. But it was just to say, Suman, I, I, um, I appreciate everything that you and your staff are doing. And please don't think of any of my email trail to you that's a criticism because it definitely isn't. It was just trying to get other answers. It was just something you said there that I just wanted to ask. I just want to know, see, with regards to, um, 
you know, the winter then, what funded actions are in place then for the winter across the um, health and social care partnership to mitigate the care for the home crisis, reduce potentially avoidable admissions to hospital care homes and support timely um, discharge? It was just because of what you said. I just wanted to know, and it was because I am looking forward to the session on the 19th, and I did appreciate that you gave figures ahead of that. Um, but when I looked at them, they're all pre-August. Um, so they're not figures that we were actually looking for um, just now. But if you could answer that question relative to what you spoke about, then I would greatly appreciate it. Yes, of course, Councillor McAdams. Uh, I'm conscious that this is an item about the budget monitoring, and I don't want to get it to disrupt the floor too much here. What I would highlight, and I can separately, I've shared with you separately, there is a paper going on winter planning to the next Social Work Resources Committee, which will which sets out uh, the kind of key line actions in terms of social care in particular. Um, there's already a paper in the public domain that we took to the Integration Joint Board about the, the, the overall action, which is more orientated toward the NHS, but that paper will go some way to answer your questions. I'll happily forward that on to you uh, rather than taking up any more time today, if that's acceptable. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, colleagues. And if we can try and, as I say, try and keep it to uh, the subject matter and we can bring that up uh, further, further down the, the agenda, if possible. Uh, I see that Cleland uh, has his hand up. Cleland, do you want to come in and then I'll bring in Richard? Yeah, really briefly, Chair, and, and because as as is pointed out, this is a, a, a budget item. Just to to note that um, a number of members have been looking for some data that belongs to the NHS in terms of their acute services, etc. Um, yes, I see that data as chair of the Lanarkshire uh, Resilience Partnership, but it's actually data that's owned by another party. Um, they need to to provide that information, and Simmons given an offer to a number of members to pass on the request for that information. They have pointed to where um, they have published some of this information, um, and there will be a time lag, as Councillor McAdams noted. But it was just to, to very quickly note that we will try and facilitate that, but it's not in our gift to give out uh, the information that belongs to another party, although Suman will hopefully be able, in the 19th, to show how that links to uh, the challenges we've currently got. And on the point that Councillor McAdams mentioned, I'll maybe get um, Kay McBay to uh, drop a note offline regarding Triple SC um, registration, because it's a matter we're discussing with government. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Cleland. Uh, Richard? Yeah, John, sorry, I know it is a budget paper, but I just want to come in just because I think we all um, share the same concerns that uh, Mark originally brought up and also that Monique had, had raised as well. Um, the first point is what Suman made about it's been better than it has been in the last two years. For me, then, has it been better because we're postponing cancer treatment and we're acute hospitals? So, therefore, is it better? I don't think it is. Because we have people who are sitting with cancer who cannot get the treatment that they require. I, I, sorry, I appreciate this is a budget paper, but I think that's pertinent to use at this point. Is that there, there's operations being cancelled, but you're sitting telling us things are better. I'm sorry, I, I, I find that difficult to, to swallow at this precise moment. The other thing you didn't mention was about GP practices and how the pressure in GP practices are having an effect on our acute hospitals at this time. Now, I'm not blaming GPs by no matter of means because um, I appreciate the pressure that they're under and the difficulty we have in staffing. GP practices are getting GPs, but GPs' practices need to become more back in line and represent our communities um, because we're all facing these on a daily basis where people can't and get appointments, or they're waiting weeks for appointments, or they're waiting on a phone for several hours to get one. The other point was just round about staffing, and yes, I agree with Mark and, uh, and Monique about the, the staffing issues that was raised in, in the media. For me as well, is it's not attractive. Um, if you look at um, some of the jobs being advertised recently, I'm going to jump from NHS, the council to NHS here. If you look at an NHS job for somebody to work in a ward as a band two, and I would urge members to go and look at a band two wage, would you work at that for a band two wage? Because you'll probably get more working in Tesco packing a sheet health than you will with the responsibility. So we need more action, we need more from the Scottish Government for more better terms and conditions for our social care staff. That's what we need. Richard, uh, thanks very much. Listen, I'm going to come in here because uh, I understand uh, these concerns from everyone. I think the right time to bring this up would be at the awareness session that Suman's going to be conducting uh, later on this month. 
and then we can certainly air our views at that. But this is really a budget monitoring paper, and I would like to try and confine it to that. Suman, I see that you want to come in for a minute, but I'm not going to allow any more questions on this uh, if it's not to do with the monitoring an item. I think we've got a chance to do that at a later date and go into it in far more detail than we're going to do in this budget monitoring paper. So, Suman, would you like to come in for the last word? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just as a point of clarity to that point, so in terms of the improved position, I wasn't talking about the totality of the system. I'm specifically talking about delayed discharge arrangements in terms of those numbers there, if you compare them, say, with 2018 or indeed 2019. There's a range of other factors which are influencing why uh, some of the NHS managers made the decisions in terms of cancer care, and we can cover that on the 19th. But again, this speaks to my point about not honing in, and I can't emphasise this enough, on single metrics as a way of taking temperature around the, the pressures in the system. Thank you. Thanks very much, Suman. Um, I don't see any other hands raised on this, so I'm going to move the recommendations. I'll second, Chair. Thank you very much. Has everyone agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item four, uh, which is capital programme. That can be found on pages 25 to 32. And Paul, could you come in on this report as well, please? Okay, thank you, Chair. This yes, covers the same time period, which is up to the 10th of September. It's obviously about the capital programme. We are looking to increase, <coughs> right, and you can see the uh, reasons for the increase uh, on Appendix 1. So that comes to £173,000. There are a number of upward and downward movements in there, uh, which you can see in the appendix. We note at 4.2 the point on the audiovisual equipment for the committee suites. Uh, around when we'd hoped to have that completed by and when I now think it's likely to be completed by. And this is really around issues in obtaining supplies of the type of equipment that we're, we're going to look to put in, in the council chamber and in committee room one. Points made at section 4.4, that in overall terms, we're spending slightly ahead of where we would have expected to be at this point. So spend's progressing okay at this point in time. And the housing programme's also covered at 5.3, uh, and there are details there of the spend on the housing programme and details around the housing investment programme. So looking for noting of the position, and I'm also looking for uh, approval of those adjustments to the programme that I talked about that are in the appendix. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, does any colleague have any questions? I see that I have um, Richard and then uh, Alec and Joe. Richard? Thanks, John. Yeah, it was just about the blended uh, model of working and I appreciate it's very difficult at the moment trying to get materials, etc. Um, but I, I was trying to say then that we will have no blended meetings in this council. Um, if that is the case, then that's disappointing because I think we, we should try and have some sort of blended working. Um, we were told originally that this would be happening in January. So by the looks of this report, I don't think it will happen in this council. So I'm just looking for some clarification on what is the plan and what do we do going forward after January? Paul? Great. No, I'm happy to come in. Yeah, the, uh, Councillor Nelson, the plan was right that we would have the work completed during January originally. The issues here, and I know we've referred in the past couple of reports to broader issues around material. <laughs> This is a more specific one, right? And it's about uh, the type of IT-related and microprocessor-related equipment that we need in order to facilitate blended learning through the routes that we're talking about here. Uh, there are widespread supply issues around these things. It's essentially beyond their control. And the message that I'm getting is that this is unlikely to be completed before the end of February. Right? So I do appreciate that limit the number of meetings that can be held using the new equipment between now and the end of the council. But essentially, it's an issue beyond our control. Um, Thanks very supplementary, much. Supplementary, John. So what is yes. the plan going forward? We continue as we are doing just now then, Paul? Is that what you're suggesting that we continue to do? Because I think we, we miss out on some some um, conversations that could be had with officers when we're at meetings I'd rather than set up meetings and, and things. Meeting um, in the chamber or, or elsewhere does have its benefits. I appreciate COVID has impacted on this, but um, what is your proposal then going forward? We continue as is until this is done, or can we get some company in to allow us that we did before? What is the, the recommendation from yourselves? Okay, in, in terms of the recommendation, uh, 
from myself around this, my intention or my proposal would be that meetings continue in the format that you're currently using until we get uh, the equipment installed as is detailed in the paper that's in front of you. Uh, thanks very much. I don't think we have any alternative. If we can't get the equipment, uh, Richard, it leaves us in a, a situation where we can't go forward with the type of blended meeting that we would like to, to take to take into consideration. It's not that yeah. we're trying to avoid it, it's just that we need the equipment in order to take that forward. No, I agree, John. I was just thinking that could we have got a company into that we did before to, to allow this to happen. Um, I'm not making a big deal about it. I just was looking for some clarification because I think we do miss out on some vital parts with meeting officers when you're in the, the chamber or in the, the big hall, whatever, meeting right. Paul, could we look into that and see what the costs would be involved in trying to do that for the small number of meetings that are left in this uh, present uh, uh, present council administration? Chair, listen, I'm happy to do that. Right, We did go through a process of obtaining a quote previously and uh, group leaders were briefed on that around you know, how that would sit in terms of a a monthly cost right against the alternative of waiting for the permanent solution to be put in. So I can come back with that information. The point I, I would maybe make though is uh, there are a couple of limiting factors. When we, <coughs> did, uh, when we did the meetings previously with the company who came in, we used the banqueting hall. Now for obvious reasons, that's currently not available to us because it's going to be used for vaccination for the foreseeable future. So our ability to do that, we need to look at, right? Uh, and I, that probably the other point I would make is the solution that the company brought in, uh, while they were, you know, this is no issue with the company, they were very good. It's not necessarily a perfect solution. I can bring back information, but you just need to bear these factors in, in, in mind. Mary, you bumped us into this. Councillor Lowe, could you, could you mute your microphone, please? You may. Councillor Lowe, could you mute your microphone, please? Hi. Thank you. Are you looking for me to talk? No, Joe, if you could possibly mute your microphone, it's just that we That's can hear that. you in the background. I'm oh, sorry. Thanks, Joe. Um, right, uh, OK. Richard, I'm going to leave it with Paul at the present time, OK? Um, can I ask Alec to come in, please? Yeah, I was... Part of it was what Richard has just brought up. But the second part, Paul, is you've indicated that the spending in the capital program is um, close enough to budget. Uh, but is the work profile keeping up with that? Because we are getting told of significant increase in costs. Are we covered for that at the moment? And is the amount of work at the end of the year going to be where we anticipated, not just the expenditure? Thanks, Paul. Okay, thanks, uh, Chair. Right. There, there's a couple of points on this, right? I would expect further items, right, to come looking to move spend out of 2021-22 into year 2022-23, and that's for reasons that we've mentioned before. So, you know, individual projects are being worked on on a case-by-case -case basis. I'd probably let... Uh, Danny came in on the building projects and uh, Michael McGlynn came in on the roads projects in a second. But while uh, you know, in certain cases spend is moving, by and large officers are working to keep project delivery as far as possible right, to the timescales that were originally indicated. So I'll, uh, at this point, if Danny or Michael wish to come in, I'll, I'll hand over to them. Danny? I'll come in first here, if that's OK. Um, <coughs> back to your point, Councillor Alison, then that is a good point to make. And I think we've said that in, in previous meetings as well, then we are actively managing our programmes. So where we are getting some material delivery issues or whatever, then we are having to adjust our programmes slightly as well. But what's key for us, particularly if, if you think about some of our larger programmes in, in relation to education and the like, is that we complete them when we were due to complete them. So there is likely to be more movement between this financial year and next financial year. 
just in terms of that bridge going into financial years about what, what we'll spend in each of them. But key and what we are actively making sure that, that, that we can deliver it upon is to make sure that the completion dates for project remain very much as is as well. So there is a, there is a fair wee bit, um, as you'll appreciate, as a result of COVID Brexit and also recently um, that there's been some issues related to releasing to projects um, due to COP26 um, because we can get road closures in place. So the, the, there's numerous factors uh, that, that are kind of causing us to have to um, continually monitor and adjust our programmes. Um, but we are um, endeavouring as best we can to make sure that they complete in accordance with the, the time skills we've agreed to our clients. Thanks, Chair. Hey, Chair, just to add to that, just uh, very briefly, um, is that Paul has trailed issues about supplies and costs. And um, I think another fact we have to consider um, is whether any tender returns that we receive represent best value at that time. And do we take a judgment on whether to wait till the market recalibrates itself um, in terms of prices, perhaps a uh, lowering? Um, I don't think prices will return back to pre-COVID. I think they'll still be high. So again, as Paul has indicated there, officers are looking at it on a case-by-case -case basis in, in assessing the priority of the project and a judgment whether it's appropriate to wait to see if the prices recalibrate. Um, and I think if Paul has trailed this is that they're likely to be further movements as we go uh, forward. But as, as we've said before, these are quite extraordinary times that we're a face in terms of a market prices and, and pressures and supply. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Michael. That's understandable. Alec, are you okay with that? Um, no, it's not quite answered. I mean, they've kept the two issues separate. I can understand that if a project's not completed, yes, budget's carried forward. That's normal procedure. What I was more concerned about was that um, a but Michael touched on there was if there's individual projects, are they going to remain within budget or are we simply using up budget to complete issues that were on or programmes that were on uh, at a inflated price and keeping us within budget as the report indicates? Um, we have been told in the past uh, that Danny was looking into uh, the implications of the price rises that we're seeing and hopefully we're going to hear from that shortlist of what the imp implications are. What I'm wanting to make sure is that although we are financially within our budget, are we also up to date in the work we expected that money to pay for? Do you understand what I am? I think that's looking into a crystal ball, uh, Alec, but uh, I'll bring, uh, I'll bring uh, Paul back in on that, uh, or Michael, one of the two of them, just to see um, I think I think the answer given uh, was as much as we can give at this time. But uh, I'll bring uh, Michael back in uh, to see if he can reassure you on that point. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. And if, um, if Paul or Danny wants to come in and uh, clarify the correct thing that I say is that I think the report that's before you just now, Councillor Allison, uh, has a program um, generally on track, as you can tell by by the spend figures. I think all that we're simply doing this now and as we've done in previous reports, is to highlight that there, as we move towards the latter part of implementation of the capital programme, we're starting to see higher prices and the supply issues coming more acute, but particularly prices, and that may result in further movements. At this point in time, we can't say what they are because uh, the project officers will work their way through it and then they'll be related through the monitoring report. So I think we're just simply uh, putting down a kind of marker that there may be further movements uh, as we move through the latter part of the programme. But currently, uh, we're on generally on track. Uh, thanks, Michael. Paul? Okay, thanks, Chair. And hopefully I can give Councillor Allison a, a degree of comfort over this one. I think, as Michael just said, and as Michael and Danny said a second ago, th these issues are being dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. See, in terms of the overall management of the capital programme, and, and the spend. Now, what, we're, what we will do is manage individual projects with the budget that's there against them. If there's an issue in terms of budget against projects, right, which could impact in timescales for delivery, I'll make them known through this paper. What we won't do is, for example, pay inflated prices 
simply to use budget that's there, right? So we would deal with things on a case by case basis, right? So if it's not going to happen, it would be taken forward to next year, right? It, it's not the case that I would uh, pay an inflated price for a project simply to use budget that's there, right? And that ties in with a message that I hope we're given around delivery of the projects as well. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, okay, Alec, uh, Joe. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to see that a number of the questions I intended to ask have, have already been asked by uh, Richard Nelson. Um, so I, I, I appreciate the undertaking that's been given. I won't labour the point. I just want to clarify, are we, are we in a position where there is no capacity to deliver hybrid meetings before February? Or is it that there are simply that there, there is, but there are limiting factors? Um, and I would just reiterate the position of the Labour Group, having spoken with group members this morning, is that if we're asking our staff to move to a model of hybrid working, then actually councillors should also be doing so, and we should be facilitating that for elected members as, as well. But as I say, I was pleasantly surprised to see that um, the, the Tory business manager had uh, preempted me in a number of those points. Joe, sure, I, think, I think I've already answered that by asking Paul to bring forward uh, some uh, ideas on how we can achieve that uh, without the necessary uh, uh, information coming forward from uh, the integrity of uh, the equipment uh, coming in. But as I say before, we had a company that came in and did it uh, in the banqueting hall. So I've asked Paul to go back and have a look uh, how we could possibly undertake that with the few remaining meetings that we have uh, and come forward with some costs as well so that we can have a look at that. So I think that question's already been answered. Uh, no, no I, 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 and as I said, I accept the undertaking. My question was just, are we saying there is no capacity to do it at all? Or are we saying there are circumstances in which we would like to do this, but we don't think we can do it properly and you know, until the issues that are in this report are, are, are given full consideration. That, that's my only question. Right. As, oh. You're quite right, the other points will be yeah. addressed in this report. I think sure. I've already asked Paul for that, but I'll, but I'll bring Paul back in. Paul. Right, thanks, Chair. If I can just make an offer here. There, there is a meeting of the Standards and Procedures Advisory Forum right at the end of the month. Right, there's an opportunity, I think, to take information and a paper to that with a view to uh, looking to get a resolution, because that's probably the appropriate forum Right, for that matter to be to be dealt with. And at that point, we can give a full picture of where we currently stand. Coming back to Councillor Fagan's point, there are probably limiting factors right around our ability to offer an alternative solution at this point. And, and one of them I've already mentioned this morning. OK, can we leave it at that, Joe, until... Uh, the standards procedures and we'll get a full explanation of what we can and what we can't do uh, in our run up to the rest of this uh, this term. I, th I thought the, the question would elicit a yes or no answer, but yes, I'm happy to leave it to this, to this paper. That's fine. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, I don't see any other hands raised, so I'm going to move uh, the recommendations. I'll second, Chair. Uh, are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, thank you very much. If we can now move on to uh, item five, which is additional funding from the Scottish Government and other external sources. That's on page 33 to 36. And uh, Paul, could you come back in on this, please? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, so this is uh, about additional funding. You can see in the first uh, page of the appendix, additional revenue funding is coming to £3.853 million. Pounds. The amounts are there. The, the two most significant amounts are in relation to discretionary housing payments and also uh, funding for the COVID family pandemic bridging payment. So that comes to 3.853 of revenue funding. There is also just over £400,000 worth of capital funding, and that's detailed on the second page of the appendix. So in terms of recommendations, uh, we're looking for noting of those additional amounts. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, does any colleague have any comment, uh, questions to ask of Paul? I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to move the recommendations. I'll second you. Thank you very much. Uh, has everybody agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, thank you very much. We move on to item six, which is a community plan quarter for progress report. Uh, pages 37. 
Two, 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 two. 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 I see him getting feedback. Is somebody not on uh, mute? Thanks very much, colleagues. Um, and I would ask Rhonda to come in on this report, please, Rhonda. Thanks very much, Chair. So the purpose of this report is to give the committee a of the progress against the South Lanarkshire Community Plan and the work of the Community Planning Partnership. You'll see in Section 3 a background as to how the plan was created and the legislative requirements around that. Also, you'll note that we have, um, in the last year, refreshed the existing plan, which was created in 2017. And I'm sure everybody's well aware of the work that's going on just now around creating a new community plan, which will sit alongside um, and completely complement the new council plan in 2022. So the, the portion we have here is on the existing plan. You'll see in section four that we present you with both the quarter four report, which shows progress using a traffic light system, which I'm sure elected members are familiar with, around the indicators from the existing plan. We're also presenting to you the annual report, which is designed for an external audience and has much more of a narrative explanation of the work of the partnership with and alongside its communities and what that's achieved and what everybody's aware was a particularly challenging year, 2020-21. You'll see there in section 4.4 that there is the traffic light system shown where there are completed and on target indicators and a smaller number of amber and red indicators. A couple of things to point out to you about this. Um, the first one is that where there is a red or an amber, there is, there is a narrative, sorry, which is included further on in the report that shows the reasons behind the indicator being shown as red or amber. Sometimes this is because of pandemic restrictions and requirements, um, meaning that there's been slow progress around particular pieces of work. Sometimes it's actually to do with the way that the indicators are written. So it's actually a positive, although it's reported as a for example, increased drugs detection is one where there has been more resourcing put into the area by Police Scotland and as a result, a higher level of detection and the way the indicator is written, that's coming up as being red. The other thing just to point out quickly is that this is obviously up until the end of March 2021. So there has been a bit of a, a um, time period that's passed since then and sometimes the indicators and the progress will have changed on particular pieces of work as a result of the really fast changing environment round about. You'll see in section 4.8 though there is a list of the, the very positive achievements of the partnership across all of the thematic pieces of work that have been carried out and then going into section 4.9 that full explanation of the narrative behind any amber or red indicators. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Thank Rhonda. Uh, I'm going to open up to colleagues' comments. I see, Richard, you've got your hand up. Thanks, John. Um, first of all, I don't think it's actually a great annual outcome improvement plan, if I'm honest. Again, I go back to um, some of the inequalities that um, as mentioned and we've already spoken about with GB pra GP practices, um, the a &E worst records in time, um, we are three of our acute hospitals in crisis, um, a code black being advised with us all. Um, we're still awaiting the official numbers that Cleland touched on earlier that we have asked for about numbers for, from these acute hospitals. Um, and sometimes it appears that there'll be more information comes from the Kremlin than would come from anywhere else. We're a public service and it's it's information that we require. It's nothing that's out of the ordinary and I think that should be shared with us uh, as, as a matter of urgency. We also have children awaiting diagnosis for autism and ADHD with some families in our communities waiting over two years for a diagnosis and the impact that that is having on these families. Now, most recently, I actually met with the Lanarkshire Autism Support Group um, with some of the families affected. Uh, and firstly, I, I must say, it was quite sad to hear what they were experiencing, their stories that they were telling me. And secondly, I was embarrassed as a local elected member um, to hear these concerns that aren't being addressed. The speech and language service, there is a two-year waiting list. The neurodevelopment team, 18 months to be seen by the neurodevelopment team. It's over two years to get an appointment with CAMS. For me, families need support now for their children. They need a diagnosis 
um, so they can get that psychological um, intervention. Um, and we need that for our con our constituents now. And I plead today that action is is required um, from someone um, here and get some work done to get these uh, numbers down. The second point I wanted to bring on was about drug deaths and what has been done more of, if not is about drug-induced psychosis. For me, there appears to be a rise in mental health issues due to misuse of drugs, which can mean damage caused by the likes of spice, which are irreversible. They cannot be reversed when the damage is done. Only yesterday it was noted that our prison service in Scotland is at a dangerous level with psychoactive drugs. Now, this is people who are going to come back out into our communities who have been using drugs. So we need to also tackle that issue at the same time. This is then putting pressure on our public services, more of acute hospital settings, and more is needed to tackle this major issue. I note that five schools within this report received physical input, and that reached 330 pupils. But given we have one of the highest drug deaths, I'm disappointed, if I'm honest, with this number that has been noted in this report. I appreciate that COVID will play a part and a point in this, but we need action now. This is not a great report, if I'm honest, but we need to do more to tackle drug deaths, drug-induced psychosis, and I, I, I think we everybody here today to rally around and get behind this. Uh, thanks for your comments, uh, Richard. They are noted. Um, and obviously, I'm hoping that uh, a lot of those things will be taken forward. Uh, David Watson? Thanks, Chair. And I think that was quite a powerful submission from Richard there. And just to have it noted, I think, does it a disservice? But uh, Richard, maybe take that up uh, elsewhere. But I, I would do a couple of points. I refer to page 41, uh, improving housing. And there's mention there of a, a 20 unit guideline uh, for. Uh, the, under the improving housing, sorry, I just lost my bit there. Uh, and I think there's been discussion at planning regarding this 20 uh, unit threshold. And I, I just maybe look for confirmation where that is, because I understand there is work ongoing with it. And uh, maybe a paper going to the senior management team. But the question being is, how will that be? Relate to councillors and what input will councillors have on that? And I've got another point, if you don't mind, John, once that's been answered. Yeah, yeah. thanks, David. Um, that point was raised by Jim Wardhall at the leaders' meeting last Monday morning, uh, and I think a report was put round. Uh, but I'll ask, um, I'll ask uh, I think it was Cleland at the time who put round a paper. There will be a paper coming forward in it. Cleland, do you want to come in on that for a second? Or Michael, sorry, Michael. I see Michael's name. It was Michael's word, so I'll just yeah. defer to him. Thanks. Oh, that's fine. Hey, thanks, Chair. Um, <coughs> so just to take a step back, I uh, recall there was a member somewhere in the session uh, back in April, uh, which I think was pretty well received as far as understood. Since then, Councillor Watson officers have been uh, reviewing this uh, 20 uh, unit trigger, uh, which is related to uh, affordable housing. Um, so that research is coming to a conclusion and proposals are being fought, uh, brought forward to the CMT later uh, this month. Uh, the intention being if there's support from that, because it is very much a corporate exercise is that will go to the uh, planning committee in February. Um, and we have to consider how we can trail that with members prior to the planning committee and get an input, uh, Councillor Watson, but we'll do that after the CMT uh, later this month. So that will give you a broad uh, time scale, but the intention is to get back to the planning committee in February. Um, and without giving a, a kind of spoiler right, on this, we're looking to review the figure kind of downwards is where we're going with that. So um, that's where we are, Councillor Watson. So hopefully that's helpful. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. That answer your first que question. Yeah, uh, Thanks very David. much. Thanks very much. Yeah. Second one probably moves on. And although not specifically mentioned in the report, but under improving local environment and communities, uh, there's reference to, to, to bus and rail travel. And the recent announcement by the Scottish Government to uh, move back and, and do a U-turn in the, the dueling of 
Baby School Bride uh, rail link to, to Glasgow uh, has got repercussions for the council. And I'm wondering where that fits in in future plans. I'm disappointed that the council's not come out and publicly condemned the, the speaker way. The government took the decision uh, to do this U turn. And I say I'd like to see the council take a, a strong line on it, both politically and at the officer level, because we have spent quite a bit of money on this. There's an expectation for the people of East Kilbride that this rail link was to be jewelled and uh, an improved park and ride facility at Hermeyer Station, which I understand has been downgraded as well. So where does that fit in with this plan? And uh, maybe we can get some reporting on this in the future. Thanks. Uh, thanks, David. Um, personally, I've written to the, the transport executive <clears throat> and a copy to the transport minister uh, regarding the... Uh, my disappointment as council leader uh, on this particular item uh, and pointing out uh, many of the items uh, that you've just raised concern with. Uh, I know the council has also uh, written to them, and I'll bring Michael in on this, uh, but as I certainly say, uh, it's not the end of the matter by any means. Uh, there are other options available, and we're trying to look at what can be done here, uh, but certainly a disappointment uh, in the non dueling has been registered uh, both at this level and I think uh, by your local MSP as well. Uh, bear with me, Michael, can you come in on this item? Yes, uh, Chair, just to kind of um, confirm at an officer level, uh, Councillor Watson, there has been engagement with our colleagues in Network Rail and Transport Scotland just about the that part of the project, but I, I think it's just important and I'm not in any way defending Transport Scotland or Network Rail is that the project itself still comprises a looking at electrification, taking the diesel rolling, diesel rolling stock off, making improvements to the East Kilbride station, still looking to relocate the Hairmile station, question marks whether that's going to be a single or double A platform. But what I would say in terms of the park and ride, that's still very mu much part of the project. That was always going to be delivered on a phase basis as we move out of COVID and understand A travel. A patterns. Um, but Network Rail has committed and purchased the land at that location, okay, so there's still a commitment to the project. But I certainly take on the, the comments made and the issues raised about the, the duelling, uh, because again, we as officers, we see that as a benefit, but it's still a good investment uh, within the rail line. Maybe not as much as we'd hope, but we'll continue to press on that. Thanks, Chair. Chair, you're on mute. Sorry, David, uh, I was on mute there. Um, do you want to combine that? Are you quite happy at this present time to let us try and see what we can do as far as maximising the benefits that are available uh, through Transport Scotland uh, and Network Rail? I would like, actually like to see a report come before councillors, whether it's the executive or community resources or the, the current situation regarding this and uh, making clear what the, the commitment is to the park and ride facility as well, because uh, that needs to be clearly mapped out and no, no further backtracking on that. Uh, yeah, and I'd like all pressure to be brought to bear on uh, Transport Minister, Scottish Government and uh, Transport Scotland. Uh, thanks, David. Michael, will you make sure that, that we, we have an up-to-date report on that? Okay. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Cheer. Just as and when there's um, significant issues to report on. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Joe, I see your hands raised. Sorry, Chair. Sorry, just on uh, Michael's response here, when there are significant things, I think there is significant things to report on. The, the project has just changed uh, by a, a fleet announcement by a government minister through a press release. And I, I think we really need an up-to-date report now. And yeah, we can that can be updated as we go along. But uh, quite frankly, I think we deserve a, a, a full report of where we stand at the present time. Thanks, Michael. Can you give us a, a report on the present situation uh, whenever uh, you get a chance to do that? OK. Absolutely, Chair. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. OK. Uh, Joe. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I always make these points that deliveries always arrive in my house at the worst possible time, and I have a funny feeling I'm about to get one. So I just want to echo what David Watson said about the school bride line. My question is really about the economic inequalities in this report, dropping credit union membership, lagging behind the Scottish average in business startups, increasing the number of South Lanarkshire residents earning less than the living wage. Um, I'd, I just want to um, see, is there a forum through which the council is seeking to highlight those economic inequalities and actually, um, is there a way of us coming together as a council to say, for all the talk of building back better, we have this now in black and white in this RAG report, the impact of the economic fallout of the COVID pandemic. Um, that, that would be the point I would wish to, wish to raise. Is there a forum through which we can collectively as a council highlight them as part of our economic strategy, which is inevitably going to have to change. And um, I would reiterate everything that David Watson has said as one of the members um, who has a East Kilbride train station in my in my ward. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Joe. I know that uh, some of the, the stats <coughs> around uh, business startups uh, isn't quite up to date. We have a new uh, company on the go elevator who are uh, doing an exceptionally good job uh, on the business startup side of things. Um, I'll bring in Cleland at this point just to give an idea where we're going with that. Cleland. Thanks, Chair. And just to, to pick up Councillor Fagan's query about where, where's the, the, the best forum for that, we, we have as part of our community planning structure, we have a, a set of outcomes and a set of outcome leads. Um, so in relation to uh, the wider economic system, mm -hmm. what as we discussed the other day there, what COVID has done is really shone a light um, on existing inequalities and actually it's disproportionately impacted on those um, who were already experiencing disadvantage. Um, we also have the Lancashire Economic Forum, which we um, co-chair along with, or sorry, co-set co up along with colleagues in North Lancashire Council. And that brings a range of the bodies who impact on economic recovery to, to the table. And then beyond that, um, we're obviously working up the refresh of our own economic um, uh, strategy. So that will be brought forward for members. So hopefully that gives some confidence to, to Councillor Fagan that the points he's mentioned are absolutely correct about how it's landed in South Lancashire and what we need to do to get effectively people back into employment where they've got a level of income, a sustainable living wage, uh, which gives them the oxygen, options and choices and addresses some of the disadvantages that's been there over a longer period of time. So uh, that would be the structure, um, Chair, just to, to map that out. Uh, thanks very much, Cleland. Maureen, I see, I see your hands up. Is that in relation to uh, your position as chair of CPP uh, or is it a question related to uh, the actual document? I was just going to more or less say what Cleland was saying there, which is um, this is not only a, this is a community planning um, report, so it's about all the partners working together. And I, you know, I think we've recognised in lots and lots of ways on a whole load of things the council can't do this on their own. It's about uh, working really closely with all the partners. I know the business community um, and the um, all the sectors, public and private, and third sector are all working together on this. There's a living wage focus later on this month. So there's an event to promote living wage. I think it's um, mid late month. Um, and there's also another lot of work going on. And the, the Lanarkshire Economic Forum is beginning to kind of get going with the subgroups working as well, which will be very focused, I think. So alongside the Community Wealth Building Commission, I think we've got the kind of places set up, ready to go. And I think that's not to take away with all the hard work that's already been going on, but uh, it's to get more focused on what we need to do in the months ahead. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Maureen. Um, I see that I have Lindsay's, Lindsay Hamilton. Your hand's up, Lindsay. Thanks, Chair. Um, I would just specifically like to ask about uh, for an update on um, the Clydesdale Stag, which is um, in this report. I see that it says that, um, it, that the review should have took place by the end of summer 2021, but we're now in November and I had asked for an update from officers in the summer and I was told it would be imminent, but with the Clydesdale councillors still haven't had any updates on it. Week in, week out, I have constituents asking me about this, which sounds a bit strange, but it, people do um, transport in 
every ward in Clydesdale is is a big issue, but also in in my ward with um, training bus services um, not being there, getting worse during COVID, and now um, with Scott with Scotdale's announcement of cutting um, rail services, then it's getting worse again. So. Um, Michael or whoever, can you please give me an update of of where the stag is and if it will be complete by March 2022? Uh, thanks, Lindsay. Michael? Yes, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, probably first, the uh, apologies to Councillor Hamilton if you never got an appropriate update and I'll take this away today and I'll seek to get an update from Roads Officers to all Claysdale members on the stag. Um, I do recall that we are looking to source funding uh, to take it to the next stage, but we'll get an update on that. And again, apologies if you never got an appropriate update. But we'll get that to you shortly. Thanks. Okay, so I can take it that this report is imminent. Okay. I would rather uh, get the update, Chair, uh, before right. you commit into that, if that's okay. Thanks. Right, okay. No. Chair, just a quick supplementary. I take it that you would need to get an update on whether it will be complete by March 2022 as well, Michael? Absolutely. We'll give you a full update to Councillor Hamilton, so I'd rather get a more a detailed position than just to uh, respond to it just now, if that's okay. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, uh, Kate? Katie, I see your hand was up. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I would like to ask a quick question around, it was the Youth Employability Service and the Aspire Service, I think it's page 46 of the report, although we need to scroll. Um, first of all, I'd say I'd appreciate all of the work that they've continued to do during the pandemic, and I know we've, we've spoken about it um, in, in other forums as well. Um, I know at the bottom of, of that page, though, there's a slight concerning um, news about the widening of the gap again in terms of positive outcomes between the most and least deprived data zones. Um, I know there have been lots of, sort of recent and pandemic related difficulties like the, the availability of foundation apprenticeship places, for example, because of restrictions on, on colleges and businesses. And that obviously relates very much to what Maureen was saying there about um, partnership working with the, the rest of the CPP and um, affiliated groups like our colleges coming into the, the Gerfic board and so on. Um, just, I mean, uh, it makes brief reference in the report to um, the fact that we are looking into this. Um, I would just wonder if we could have some more information on the steps we're taking to look into this gap, which seems to be opening again. Um, I've got a slight concern that if it's to do with difficulties during engagement during the pandemic, then those same difficulties, uh, so the engagement with young people themselves during the pandemic, that lack of engagement or difficulties in engaging might actually have an effect on, on how we can make progress and, and finding out what is happening here. Uh, thanks very much, Kate. Question, Chair, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Can someone come back uh, on that, please? Education or Cleland? Yeah, Chair, I, I, I don't, without throwing, a, throwing a, a hospital pass to Carol McKenzie, um, if it's possible, um, Katie, just to, to give us a wee bit of chance to, to speak to the Aspire team um, about the progress I've made. Um, I think during the, the pandemic period from um, the, the discussions and I went out to meet the team during the, the, the period, um, the, 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 they have done a remarkable job um, in sustaining positive destinations for our young people and in particular um, I'm going to flag up the work that we've done in terms of our care experience, young people. But rather than um, <coughs> as a this directly on Carol, um, I'll, I'll give her a chance to come in just now. But perhaps we can come back with a little bit fuller information and potentially deploy that up through the Education Resources Committee. But Carol, is that giving you a wee bit of time to prepare that one? Thanks. Apologies, um, I was muted there. Morning, everybody. Um, yeah, absolutely. I would say also that um, there's work ongoing, as I'm sure you know, um, Casey, around the MCR Pathways development, which is being rolled out to a number of additional schools next session, which is directly looking at young people that have been targeted by you know, poverty, disadvantage, care experienced. Um, and there is a huge amount of work going in to making sure that we, first of all, identify what any new gap is. I think that's the, the, the crucial bit. The, the, we need to, to get that baseline now post-COVID. 
um, and continue um, to, we have got, you know, numerous um, initiatives that are going in through Aspire, through our work with the colleges. Um, we've got our um, increased funding for a study, for supported study for these young people. Um, but absolutely, we can, um, you know, we can make sure that, you know, probably the, the next committee, education committee, that there's a full paper that's specifically around in this particular group of vulnerable young young people, if that would help. Uh, thanks very much, Carol. Um, I'm seeing that we've now been on the go for an hour and a quarter. Uh, I'm conscious uh, of uh, a break time. I, I see that we've still got several hands raised on this item. Um, and obviously it could take another wee while before it's uh, finished. So I'm going to stop just now for a 10 minute break uh, and we'll resume uh, at 25 past 11. OK, thanks very much.
have still uh, a fair bit of the agenda to go and also the Climate Change Sustainability Committee. So can I ask colleagues to keep comments as brief as possible uh, and only really ask questions of the officers if required and hopefully we should get through the, the rest of the meeting uh, in, in a timely manner. Thanks very much, Alan Falconer. I see your hands raised, Alan. Thanks, Jack. Ricardo. Hello. Okay. Yes, we hear you, Alan. Right, thanks, Chair. It's in page one nine two participatory budget in relation to the air place air plan in Hull House. Uh, the last two community councils I've attended in Hull House, which are very well attended, and as you appreciate, community councils are the first tier of local government. There's also other community groups here, and there's been questions raised about the transparency of how these participate in the budget grants are given. Alex, uh, uh, Alan, is yeah. this uh, in relation to items that you've raised before uh, about no, the community council? Uh, excuse me, excuse me. That item I've raised before will be raised in a further paper, a further item. This is actually in re relation to participate in the budget. The fact that the Community Council, First Tier of Local Government and several groups in Hull House are unhappy about the transparency of how the grants are given. People make an application for a grant. We prior to going to the last meeting asked for a copy of the applications and was told by the two officers running it, no, we looked through the grants and they then gave a verbal summary at the meeting. Then people are told to go away and vote and they're told to chase up votes. Uh, and I think that's it's not very transparent uh, the way it's been done. And I think it might be an idea if the community council, if Rhonda or one of our many staff could come along at the community council and explain how this is done uh, and address the issue. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Rhonda, could, could you come in on this, please? Absolutely. More than happy to come along to the community council um, and have a discussion with them about that. So... Um, I'll, I'll arrange that. Thanks very much, Councillor Falcon and Chair. Thanks, Rhonda. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Thanks very much. Uh, Alec Allison. Chair, Alec, we're not hearing you. No, he's, I don't know what's happened. He's actually just phoned me. He's on the meeting, but he can't hear or see anything. Chair, he's having difficulties. I think we'll need to get IT support onto this. Uh, right, we'll take Chair, Chair, he had, he had to take his headphones out at one point. And that uh, that's, a, that's OK. We'll come back to Alec in a minute okay. then. Uh, Monique? Hi, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, thanks, um, David, for um, bringing up the issue of the train line. And, John, also, I'm glad to hear that... Um, the, that you have basically the satisfaction um, to okay. the transport secretary. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I've been conversing with the officers and I just feel that the lack right. of information that they were given was like poor. But what I wanted to raise was it was to do with the 13 million that Michael touched on. And it was obviously it's been paid out from the public purse. So it was already spent to purchase the land at Hare Myers. The Transport Minister has put in, in correspondence that it is 400 spaces now, not the 1,200 that was originally spoken about. He also cited in his letter that it was actually geotechnical risks for the change in the plan, um, but it had already been announced that money was actually getting spent in the borders, so I don't know where that came from. Also, it was to say that Network Rail has been well paid to develop the project over recent years, and I'm sure that the engineering specialists that they employ are more than capable of developing a robust engineering solution to support the double tracking. The other thing was we had a memorandum of understanding that was passed at council towards this very project, and it was for us when we agreed the sum of £4.25 million that was going to go to the interchange um, hub and also for the car parking spaces. Um, and my final point for us to tell you that my questions was that Scottish Government Real Decarbonisation Plan anticip anticipated savings of over 1,000 tonnes of CO2 annually by electrifying and double tracking um, this train line. So my questions that I have are, when was... South Lanarkshire Council informed of this decision to downgrade the plan and why didn't they then send out and inform the elected members? Why did we need to approach them? My next question is, 
Is the land going to get signed over that the 13 million has been paid for for both sides of the track? Because I think that should be signed over to South Lanarkshire Council. Um, and also, is South Lanarkshire Council still intending building out the 1,200 spaces? Because we are going to need a place because we don't have any flat, we don't have any access for you know the flats to be able to um, charge up their electric cars, which obviously there's you know we've got a date for when that's coming in. So that would actually be the ideal place for people that have the electric cars to encourage them. They would go there, they would park their car, they would charge it up, it would be electric, and then they would get on the chain. And the final point was, has the Scottish Government said anything about the four trains an hour? Because I know from speaking to Network Rail, it's complex timetable and negotiations that they went through to allow the four trains an hour at the peak time in the morning and the peak time in the afternoon. And the, it, it's too much for them. So they won't be putting on four trains an hour at any other time. So that's why the double tracking was there to facilitate. So... It's not really a political point I'm making. It's more a case of I would like everybody that is a member of East Kilbride and South Lanarkshire to actually get behind this back up, John, um, you know, and obviously what he's put to the Scottish Government to say that we don't think it's acceptable um, and get behind it. And the final point was um, actually um, the MSP hasn't come out in support because she refused to sign a cross-party letter and she's not signed the real petition either but thank you uh, thanks me i think uh, michael's already said he's going to produce a full report on an up-to-date situation for us uh, on that michael would you like to come in there yeah just just maybe um briefly to hopefully give some clarification on the four points uh, that was raised as best i possibly can so the first point when did we find out um um I was on leave at that particular week, but my understanding, uh, Councillor McAdams, is that we found out at the same time as members found out. So we weren't in a position to give you early notice. So that's my understanding of it. Um, the land is uh, purchased by a uh, network rail. Um, in terms of project development, uh, there's a number of options you can look at. You could uh, license uh, the land across to the council. You could transfer it across to the council. There may be arrangements about any potential future uses, etc. So they are being um, pursued. Our preference is to have control of the land because that's how we control our car parking going forward. I think I said in response to Councillor Watson, um, prior to this announcement, we were always going to look at it on a phase basis in terms of numbers so we can understand a travel pattern. So that that, that is still the case with the a revised project. And on the four times an hour on the trains, we're seeking clarification on that. My current understanding is uh, that's not in uh, the proposals. I believe there's three trains an hour during peak, um, but we're seeking clarification on what the frequency would be. Um, but Chair, th that's just an initial response to those uh, points. And then again, I'll just take away when it's appropriate to bring a report back to probably community and enterprise is the best place. Thanks, Chair. Chair, can I have uh, a thanks very much. please? Yes, okay, Monique. Um, it's just a quickie. It's just to say, when the original plans came in, Michael, so it was like four trains an hour. So it would be like effectively from like your seven to your eight, whereas just now there is four trains within a 60 minute period. But I think, say, for instance, in the morning it's 7 11 to, you know, you know, I don't know, just before 8 03 or something like that. Um, but it was just to say to you with regards to when you had said that the preference would be to take on the land. The reason why I'd asked that question, I think it's really important, is because we really need to be in control of that so it can't be a simple case of the decisions taken away from South Lancashire Council at another time after we've committed through that memorandum of understanding to commit the 4.25 million. And, and obviously it's it's for you know our climate targets as well. So I think it's really, really important that we actually secure that land and that land actually does get signed over to us so that it's a simple case of we can do it at our leisure, um, you know, and it's not that it's that we're then beholden to somebody else because we don't want to be back in um, this situation again. So I think that John Ross did the right thing um, by raising it. And I would just ask everybody else to get behind it. And thank you for answering the questions. Uh, thanks, Monique. Um, Alan, I see your hand still raised. Is that a legacy hand? Sorry, Chair, it was a legacy. Thanks very much. I see Alec. Is Alec now with us again? Alec. <coughs> I'm back, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I want to go back to a previous subject as well that Joe wrote 
uh, Joe brought up regarding business startups, etc. John, I can accept what you say. We have a new contractor in place, but what you're saying is either is actually more in hope than anticipation at the moment. The figures we're working on here go between 2016 and 2019. We're now at the end of 2021. A new contractor will take a length of time before we can see any difference they've made. These the figures could be five years time before we actually know what is going on. And yeah. I don't think that that is particularly acceptable. You then follow on to what's happening within the labour market at the moment that we discussed the other day. We had a, a jobs fair, 500 jobs at that fair, and I can't remember, was it you said 20-odd people turned up? No, no, it was six, six to nine, I think. Six to nine, apologies. Six to nine, still, six to nine, 500 vacancies. There is a disconnect somewhere in here. And I don't think we can just leave it as a red mark on a report. We actually need to take it forward, find out why so few people are coming forward for these jobs, not what people think, what's actually happening, so that we can put policies and programmes in place to, one, help businesses start up, two, to make sure they survive and not need to wait to five years before we find out what's happening, and three, um, support people who are looking for a change uh, and find out why um, or what we need to do to be able to help that. It's bad enough, the overall picture in Scotland, but within South Lanarkshire, we seem to be below average. So therefore, we need to do more now. Uh, thanks, Alec. Listen, as chair of the, the Business Gateway Steering Group, we're already seeing improved figure, figures at this early stage from the new a company that will get an elevator. So I have no problem uh, saying that I think we're going to see uh, large improvements as we go forward, but I'll bring in Michael in, in this. Michael. Just two very quick points, since I'm very conscious of time, is um, you've already referred to the, the steering group um, that manages the contract uh, with offices and elected members along with North Lanarkshire Council. So there, be, there will be more regular figures, Councillor Alison. And uh, in past years, this year has been uh, different. We we normally give uh, an annual update on economic development activities and outcomes. Um, so that would probably be into uh, next year that that update. So you won't be waiting uh, five years. <laughs> and I think the steering group actively manage the contract to make sure that it does deliver on, on the outcomes and the differences. So hope that will give you some reassurance, uh, Councillor Allison. Thanks. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Can I ask uh, Carol uh, to come in, please? Carol, I see your hands up. Sorry, you're on mute. Okay. Carol, I'm not hearing you. Right, I'll give Carol a minute. Uh, I'll go on to Peter Craig. Peter. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, I think I think what we've got here is a very honest report. Uh, it's what's and all. Uh, and, you know, although uh, we've had a lot of negative comments about the negative things that are in the report, uh, you know, that's the job. Uh, I don't condemn MD for, for bringing those up. Uh, these are unprecedented times. We all know that. Uh, what COVID's done uh, to our communities uh, over the past two years has been pretty awful. Uh, so all I wanted to say, Chair, was uh, to congratulate uh, our officers and our partners for the work that they're doing to try and restore some order to uh, what has been pretty chaotic uh, in the past. And I didn't want this to, because I there has been uh, quite right, there's been some negative comment coming out, uh, but I don't want to demotivate MD uh, because they've been, as far as I can see, they've been working really hard to do their best. So I just want to make that point here. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, Joe, I see your hands raised. I'm very, very aware of time. So I, I, I just wanted to kind of make a suggestion, having listened to um, some of the some of the discussion there, because I'm, I'm gratified to hear that, you know, you've written to Transport Scotland about the, the kind of the U-turn on dual tracking in East Skilbride and that we are united in demanding that full upgrade of the line. Now, the point was made in, in response to my previous question, quite rightly, that this isn't a council report. This is a um, 
a community planning partnership report. Um, and if we think of that process of communities identifying needs and ambitions and then trying to align services with meeting those needs and ambitions, it just seems to me that this is a pretty obvious case of where we could be of where we could be doing that um, in relation to uh, in relation to transport. And I wonder and I realise that some of the partners that we mentioned actually sit outside that community planning framework like SPT and, and Transport Scotland. But I wonder if is there actually a way of of, of kind of drawing drawing them in, um, and is there a, a process by which we can, given the the other documents that we referred to earlier and that Maureen Chalmers referred to earlier, through which we can actually align these different organisations around, I would call it a campaign, but other people might not want to call it a campaign, but just a push to secure the necessary rail improvements that we need in East Kilbride. But actually, I think that relates to other areas as well, like the Clydesdale the Clydesdale stag. So I'm conscious of time and I'm not necessarily expecting an answer to that here and now, but it was a, a my attempt at a constructive suggestion to try and move some of this this agenda on. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joe. Bring Maureen in on that one. I think she's probably got something to say on it. Maureen. Just for clarification, uh, SPT is a member of the Community Planning Partnership Board um, and I think that transport in Gronda would maybe correct me if I'm wrong here, is emerging as part of the community conversation as a theme that's been considered. Okay. Chair. Uh, thanks very much. Yep. Chair, could I add to what Maureen's just said? Um, SPT is currently going through a regional transport uh, upgrade to its policy, so now is the time for South Lanarkshire to make the representations to SPT so that it's uh, incorporated in the new transport strategy for all of Strathclyde area. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, David. We'll take that on board and I'll have a word with Maureen about how we can best uh, try and achieve uh, what Joe was talking about. <coughs> okay. Carol, Carol uh, I see your hand still raised. I'm not sure if it's a legacy hand or not. Apologies, it is a legacy hand. Okay, thank you very much. I, I see no further hands raised on this, so I'm going to move the recommendations. I'll second, Chair. Thanks very much. Are we agreed? Agreed. Oh, well, thank goodness for that. Okay, let's move on to the next item, uh, which is uh, an item uh, for decision. It's land and property transfers, pages 203 to 206. And I would ask Danny to come in on this one, please. Danny. Thanks for that, Chair. Um, the report this morning looks for committee to declare the small site at Clyde Terrace in Bothell, um, which is highlighted in the location plan on page 206 of your papers, surplus, um, in order to facilitate the recycling of the existing electricity substation, which currently sits in the middle of the new nursery site. The report also looks for the four areas of land listed on Appendix A to also be declared surplus to allow their disposal to the adjacent owners who primarily want these for use as additional garden ground and in the case of the plot of some Lee Road Lark Hall also as a driveway. Um, I'll take members back to the recommendations chair that they have been asked to declare the land listed in Appendix A as surplus to council requirements. Thank you. Uh, thanks very, very much Danny. Does any colleague have any questions to raise to Danny? I'm not seeing any hands raised so I'm going to move the recommendations. I'll second you. Thanks very much. Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to another item for decision. It's a review of the financial advice and support. Uh, it's on pages 207 to 214. And uh, Craig Ferguson to speak to report. But I know that Maureen had uh, uh, put in a, 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 an interest in this. So if you could possibly leave the, the meeting, Maureen. And could you invite Maureen back in once the item's finished, Polly? Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Craig, left. Thank you very much. Craig, could you take us through this report, please? Yeah, thank, thank you, you Chair. Uh, so the report provides committee with a summary of the review of financial advice and support and, importantly, the key improvement actions that have been identified. 
In terms of background, the purpose of the review was to appraise the range of financial advice and support services provided by the Council and identify the improvements that could be made. The services themselves included within the review were Money Matters Advice, the Benefits of Changing Team and the Scottish Welfare Fund. Uh, importantly as well, the review also sought to identify opportunities to improve joint working with the Citizens Advice Bureaus. Section 4 confirms the current position uh, with the core provider obviously being the Money Matters Advice Service and Appendix 1 within the report provides information on the performance levels of the services included. Um, the Citizens Advice Bureau is also a key provider as I mentioned operating across all four South Lanarkshire localities with an offer presence and in each and obviously the interventions there are delivered by CEBs do contribute to the Tackling Poverty Programme Child Poverty Action Plan and also the Community Plan. Section 5 into a bit of detail around the, the review activity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that review activity was progressed by two working groups, one focusing on the provision of council services and the <coughs> other particularly on the joint working arrangements with the CABs. Um, and just to give you a feel for some of the work that was undertaken there, we conducted a fairly limited service user engagement exercise during August of last year. 89% of users confirmed they were satisfied with the services provided and key recommendations that followed from that focused on the enhancement of their online presence and also need to carry out more regular satisfaction surveys with our customers. We also assessed the customer contact routes yeah, and that exercise highlighted improvement across providing a wider range of uh, digital solutions to improve customer access um, to services and also to information and also to establish an effective triage and referral process. This work then led into the assessment of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And just at 5.5 in the report, it just gives you a feel for some of the information that came through from the, that piece of work. And particularly on the strengths, just to highlight there's a skilled, experienced, well-motivated workforce, know their client base very well indeed. Um, there is obviously a weakness around just that ability to make sure we're fully engaging digitally with customers and also across services within the council itself. And obviously what's presented now uh, is a more it's an opportunity to adopt a more agile way of working across services. We'll point a little bit more detail uh, later on in the report. And obviously in terms of our threat there, the effects of the current pandemic are expected and are seeing more people requiring access to support services offered by the Council and by also CAB and that may in turn put a strain on existing resources. The review groups also considered how the impact of COVID affected the way in which services been accessed and delivered and face-to-face -face services were suspended and all customer contact delivered via telephone or online. And that's been the case now uh, pretty much since March of last year. We were trying to turn it into a positive we now see this as being very much a catalyst for change and certainly that experience of the past 18 months where clearly has presented various challenges, it has demonstrated that both customers and service have adapted to a different service delivery model very well. Uh, however, we do see an expectation that demand for advice and support will remain high for the foreseeable future, uh, not least with the ending of furlough at the end of September. Uh, members may also recall the various briefings provided during 2020-21 on how the range of Scottish Government funding has been used to provide, in many instances, direct financial support uh, to families and to communities to help see them through the challenging times presented by, by the health pandemic. Section 6 focuses on the improvement actions that have been identified uh, and taken together these actions will improve the service provided to customers by further investing in technology and staff, by joining up services, giving better information the services available to customers and overall very much by improving that service offering at a time obviously when it's most in need. So in total there are 16 improvement actions identified and they are detailed in the appendix to uh, within the report. Uh, I've highlighted a couple of these here at 6.3 one being implementation of a new case management system for the Money Matters service. This will very much improve how advisors manage their case loads uh, and also provides a, a, an enhanced ability to engage digitally uh, with, with customers themselves. Um, looking to include uh, Money Matters, Scottish Welfare Fund, benefits and revenues, customer services and wellbeing under like an umbrella service um, covering the well-being, financial advice and customer services structures. Yeah, in terms of that joint working that was progressed with CAB, 
there's a recognition jointly that a, a more kind of formal structure uh, to that engagement should give it a much better approach to sharing good practice and also developing uh, joint initiatives uh, on an ongoing basis. It was recognised by the group the benefits would arise from the move from money matters within social work to finance transactions. Uh, that should help contribute to a higher profile of wellbeing services more generally and improve joint working and also closer links with some of the existing services that have that kind of tackling poverty and wellbeing remit within finance and corporate resources. But of course, importantly to highlight that advisors within Money Matters will continue to support their, client, uh, their clients directly, making sure the advice they get is always in their, their best interests. The service itself will also work towards accreditation through the Scottish National Standards for Debt Advice uh, as administered by the Scottish Legal Aid Board over the, the coming two years. Uh, I'd mentioned earlier there about the, the opportunity presented by Agile Working and over the past 18 months, Money Matters in particular has adapted very, very well. Customers too have responded well to much more flexible um, service offering. And certainly there's an opportunity now to review that structure, given the benefits from Agile working and also the future benefits expected from a new case management system. So the new structure itself was presented at Appendix 3, uh, showing that the proposed addition of Money Matters advice. Uh, in terms of the employee implications, um, if accepted, the, the transfer uh, of money matters to finance transactions would see that the transfer of just under 55 FTE. Um, staff within the service have been fully briefed on the planned transfer and um, there was rep representation from Unison throughout the review. I wish to refer uh, members back to the recommendations within the report and that point one, the summary of the review itself is noted. The range of actions in section six and fully detailed in Appendix 2, detailed and improvements are noted. And thirdly, that the transfer of money matters advice from social work resources to finance and corporate resources be approved. And thank you, Chair, and happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, Craig. Um, I see that I've got some colleagues wishing to ask questions. Uh, Alan Faulkner. Thanks, Chair. Uh, as I said about the participatory budget meeting, uh, I'm raising, you're well aware, I raised an issue about citizens' the advice bureau getting £12,000 for the Hill House OPOP uh, participatory budget. And what shocks me with this report is at the meeting that they get at 12 grand, money matters were there, social work were there in housing, and they passed to give £12,000 to the Citizens' Advice Bureau to do benefits. Now, uh, I know Alan, where, I'm, just, Alan. excuse me. I know, I'm, I'm not excusing you, Alan. This has been brought up before, uh, and this was a decision taken by uh, the Community Council uh, in Hill House. The Community Council just it's said not, they don't get hangmen. It's not for this uh, forum here, right, Alan. Chair, I'm not talking about that to decision. Can I just say, I find it alarming that Money Matters have 55 staff and a budget of £2 million in an area of poverty, been urban aid and that, that they had to go and pay 12 grand out of the participatory budget to another organisation that we fund. I think it's disgraceful. I think it's disgraceful that senior officers in this council yep. supported that. That's my, yeah. I've made my point here. Thank you. I'm in here, if that's possible. Uh, Councillor Faulkner has had a written response on this very issue on two occasions across the past 18 months. Right? So there was a, a written response given in July 2020 and at the end of August 2021. I haven't had any subsequent follow-on questions from those written responses. Right? But if there's anything that Councillor Faulkner would like me to take him through, I'd extend the offer again to do that. But I do agree with you, this is probably best dealt with offline. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. You've heard the result there, Alan. If you want to bring this up any further at any time, you're going to have to go back to Paul with, with whatever you want him to produce for you, rather than just keeping bringing up uh, an open council. Thanks very much. Today I'm going to standards, can I? Thank you. Uh, Lindsay, I see your hands up. Thank, thanks, Chair. Um, I've just got two, two quick questions, um, Craig, if that's all right. Um, so, obviously, um, it said that the pandemic's been a catalyst for change in terms of... Um, 
people having to do um, welfare rights officers having to do their work online etc um, just the, um, the service users some of the service users that might not suit and especially around um, appeals and, and stuff like that and um, welfare rights officers seeing people face to face I pro- I suppose I just want to um, get the assurance that that will still take place um, and also um is there any? Is it now just going to be online, or is there any plans um, moving forward that face to face meetings will will resume? Um, and I suppose I, I'm not sure if it's for this um, this um, this item or not. But um, in Appendix One, um, it shows you the the sheer amount of work that the Welfare Rights Service does um, for the council. Um, and the amount of money that it brings into the local area, which is, which is absolutely amazing. However, I was just wondering about the Scottish Welfare Fund and why the award rate is below half. Um, it, it just seems that that's, that's quite strange that it's, it's so low, um, considering it would probably be welfare rights officers that are um, maybe recommending people to go to the Scottish Welfare Fund. Um yeah, no, thanks, Councillor. Yep. Uh, on your first point in relation to to face to face, um, we still very much see a place for face to face appointments. Uh, given the nature, you know, of advice services, that has certainly got an important place going forward. Uh, I'd say prior to COVID, that was very much the kind of default service offering within Money Matters. I think what we've seen now during the past eighteen months is that customers actually like to have the flexibility um, to have a telephone appointment. Quite often it can mean quicker access to advice for the individual uh, and certainly a quicker turnaround as well. Um, but yeah, I think you know, going forward, face-to-face will be an important feature. Um, another wee point I'd make as well is that you know, unfortunately there were times when you know we would see quite a large level of no-shows at appointments. Uh, and ultimately, when we move towards you know, an agile way, I think it's one that you know, ultimately gives advisors much more flexibility in how to deliver service but still one is very much focused around the needs of the customer too. Um, in relation to the Scottish Welfare Fund, decisions on that they are made by a dedicated team within the Benefits and Revenue Service, which is quite distinct um, from Money Matters. Uh, and essentially, the, the de- uh, they make a decision um, based upon um, the guidance that um, is used nationally for making awards, essentially based upon the information provided by the applicant. Of course, there's any kind of concerns about that, but there is an engagement with the applicant concerned to make sure we've got all the full facts um, for that. So, yeah, I think certainly in terms of Scottish Welfare Fund, it's an area if we, do, if we can improve the awards, we'll certainly try to do so. But to just um, obviously the point here is, uh, is against um, guidance that we operate under, as do all Scottish local authorities. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kate, Katie. Hi, Chair. Thanks very much. Um, First of all, I'd like to say absolutely welcome the points in the report about joint working with CAB. Um, I think for many of us, casework has become increasingly complicated because of various factors over the the past few years. And you can start to um, have cases which uh, will bring in legal matters. There can be issues about residency, settled status, interactions with the benefit system and so on. Um, And without naming names, I'm thinking of one constituent in particular, um, I I can't praise highly enough the professionalism and the the level of knowledge and the care shown to that individual by the CAB. Um, One question I did want to raise, I think uh, um, Money Matters moving to under finance umbrella potentially raises a question mark about its perception as an independent service. Um, in people's minds um, and appreciate the detail given at, at 6.5 about how it will operate completely independently and so on. I'm just looking for a bit of reassurance that that will be communicated to the public and service users as well very clearly if they if they're asked to be involved with Money Matters because I think um, trust is, is such an important factor here. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Katie. Uh, I really do uh, acknowledge that, that side of things. Uh, it was one of my first uh, uh, ponderables when we looked at this, the very fact that we need to make sure that it is seen by the public to be truly independent. Uh, Craig, do you want to come back on that? 
Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I, mean, I think certainly in terms of that, that perception, I can certainly acknowledge that that is certainly a view that can be held. Um, but I think for me, the most important thing to, to, to emphasise is that, you know, Money Matters has operated independently prior mm -hmm. to any proposed transfer uh, and assurance from me that that will continue to be the case. Um, and obviously we've mentioned the report around the, the move towards accreditation through national standards. That's quite an undertaking for the service. There's roughly about 10 councils across Scotland that uh, currently have that level of accreditation. Uh, it's something that will certainly entail a, a lot of effort from the staff involved, but it's one that I think you know hopefully kind of further demonstrates. And, and ultimately through gaining that accreditation requires the service to demonstrate its independence, to demonstrate its professional competence. Thanks very much, Craig. Uh, Gladys? Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Yeah, it, it, it's it's funny because I would imagine that uh, a lot of people would think of transaction services as, you know, bringing money into the council. However, after working closely with them throughout um, the Scottish Government's uh, business grants. I think all they've done for the past two years is give money out. <laughs> um, in terms of the, the Money Matter service, I think it's a fantastic service. I've uh, referred a lot of constituents and they've come back and some of them have come back with absolutely glowing reports um, of you know the help that they've had. And see to see that service now completely reformed. They joined up working with the Benefits of Changing team and the Scottish Welfare Fund and particularly the agreed joint council with the CEB. I think it's being an IT person, one of the big things for me. I thought, great, they're going to get a new case management system and a lot of the communication will include uh, a lot of IT. I think it's absolutely fabulous. Thanks very much, uh, Gladys Alec. Thanks, John. Um, we had a discussion of this that Leaders in Cleland has uh, forwarded basic response, particularly regarding the IT and making sure that with these changes we're not going to diminish the certain uh, you know what I mean, the, uh, the service at all. Um, and that is very important. It as already highlighted, or still having the paper back up there for those who can't access IT is important. But also the organisations more closely working together. We need to make sure it's the best of standards there that, that are adhered to. Um, for instance, uh, get my initials right, SWF, I believe, has a two to three day standard for replying to an inquiry. And I think, and apologise if I'm wrong, but the benefits are changing, team. It's 14 days. Now, I think that we need to uh, make sure that it's to the highest standards there that these organisations are going to be working to and working more to the, in that particular case, the, th the three day. But overall, the standards must be um, to the highest standard. The one thing that I think is maybe missing from here, unless I've missed it in reading the papers, is that having a single point of contact and then allowing them to put it to the most appropriate department, if 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 you like. We can't expect members of the public to know whether it's whether to contact CAB, Money Matters, Benefits Changing Team, or the Scottish Welf Welfare Fund, or wherever. So having a single point of contact, I think, would simplify the system greatly. So more a comment other than that, John. Uh, thanks very much. Craig, do you want to come back on the time scale there? Yes, yeah, certainly can. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think, Councillor, in relation to the two-day period you talk about for Scottish Welfare Fund, that's in relation to the processing target um, for crisis grants. Um, the equivalent for processing and community care grants is slightly longer. That's measured according to the 15-day target. Um, I think in terms of the benefits are changing team, their 14-day target may well be in relation to responding to general correspondence. Um, I think in relation to the point around the single point of contact, I think that is definitely like an ideal model. Uh, there's no doubt the report does actually point to that in terms of the role for a telephone support team. We do have a community wellbeing team within the council. Um, just now, certainly, they're very much 
uh, involved in providing self-isolation support um, to residents. Uh, where those details are passed over from the NHS and clearly there's been some fairly large peaks over the past few months in terms of the volume of work coming their way. However, the intention very much is that, you know, hopefully we get to a position where the COVID numbers do start to recede uh, and ultimately helps to develop that community wellbeing offering uh, into something that essentially provides that kind of single point of contact where it offers a level of triage potentially for those more vulnerable, potentially to those who have perhaps you know, multiple issues, not too sure who to speak to across a range of council services. Um, direct contact, though, will always be a feature, uh, whether it be the Scottish Welfare Fund, whether it be council tax, whether it be benefits are changing. So I think the most important thing we can do is offer a multiple uh, contact channels for customers to make sure they're getting the help and support uh, they need um, from council uh, services. Uh, thanks very much for that assurance, Craig. Um, I see Alan has his hand up again. Alan. Thanks, Chair. I'm just going to say, Money Matters Independence comes into the same category as the Lanarkshire Carers Centres, the Advocacy Service, right? They're all funded by the Council. And then the old saying goes, who pays the fiddler calls the tune? That's my experience in 20 years in social work. It's not the first time I've heard a social worker when an advocate's done a case for somebody saying they need to remember who pays their wages. That's just a view I have. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks for these comments, Alan. Um, I see no more hands raised on this item, uh, so I'm going to move the recommendations. I'll Can I have a care. seconder? I'll Thank, you very, okay. Thank you very much. Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, Agreed. Thanks very much, uh, colleagues. We'll move on to item Chair, nine. If you just let me call in Councillor Chalmers to the next item. Thank you very much. Item business. Morning away for a lunch. Councillor Chalmers is now back in the meeting chair. <laughs> okay, doke. Thanks very much. Uh, welcome back, Maureen. Um, can we now continue with item nine, which is South Lancashire Council's response to the Scottish Government's National Care Service consultation? That's on page 215 to 255. And I would invite Cleland to speak to this, please. Cleland. Very much, Chair. And uh, again, for, for time, uh, members will be aware that uh, this uh, significant topic has been the subject of two member sessions um, in recent months, uh, the last of which was uh, on Friday last week. Um, so I'm going to go reasonably quickly through what's a very detailed issue and a detailed response. Um, again, uh, members will be uh, recall the background to the Independent uh, Review of Adult Social Care, um, chaired by Derek Feely and um, subsequent to the publication of his report um, pre-election, uh, you'll note that um, I think probably the first time in my career, all uh, national parties agreed with the establishment of a national care service and subsequent to presentation at COSLA, all parties represented in COSLA um, rejected the model that's set out in the um, consultation document. So very much a national uh, a, and local um, perspective on this and, and potentially a national versus local perspective on it. So um, in terms of the council response, um, just to, to signpost some of it, it uh, goes into some of the context um, around uh, social care and uh, we recognise uh, uh, many of the issues that the, in the, uh, the initial review pointed to as frustrations within the system. We also um, welcomed and support, uh, would be supportive of many of the outcomes that that review pointed to. But the short version in the uh, context section is that um, the context we have been working in has been chronic underfunding of uh, adult social work and adult social care system over decades. And uh, that's led to procedures to ration care <coughs> that have been provided and a lack of investment in preventative support that's led to some of the conclusions that was reached in the original review. Um, there's a, an expectation um, in, in terms of the, 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 the um, structure of the, the, the report. Um, we would expect something of this level of significance. This is the biggest potential structural change to local government or change in our legal accountability since 1996. 
and you would anticipate that any proposals based on that would be underpinned by a huge level of detail um, in relation to what's described as an entitlements-based model, sometimes referred to as a human rights-based model, that's, that's a, a bit emotive, but effectively that people would have an entitlement to a standard bureaucracy light uh, set of supports with more complex care um, assessments on top of that. Um, but none of that detail is in the report. It doesn't exist at this stage. And we are uncertain what that entitlements-based model actually means, what, what it entitles people to, what tiers would be within that, and ultimately who would um, be able to access those supports. Therefore, there's no detail around what <coughs> this uh, would cost. And there's a scant reference to the long-term funding model that would need to be in place, presumably a tax model to um, support this. So there's a huge range of uncertainties and ambiguities that our response highlights. Our response goes in to identify a number of issues, risks and challenges with the set proposal within the document. Effectively, respondents are being uh, presented with, do you wish to stick with the existing system and all the uh, challenges it presents and all the frustrations that it delivers, or do you want to agree with this one single model which is predicated on uh, taking the legal accountabilities away from local government for adult social work and adult social care, and actually expands the scope of the proposals to include a range of other uh, functions that went beyond the original report, including children and family social work, justice social work, alcohol and drug partnerships, etc. So the next section within the, the uh, summary response is uh, around scoping the National Care Service. Um, there are undoubtedly um, actions and areas that taking a national approach would add value. Um, it doesn't include the full range as noted in the consultation response, but there are some areas where certainly it would um, provide some additional um, value to that. And we set some of those out within the, resp the response. And then finally, um, the, there's a set of recommendations which are embedded in our response. Um, and that basically starts with doing some of the hard work first um, in terms of uh, defining the model, scoping out um, uh, the kind of volumes, costing it, and thinking about how you can uh, uh, fund that uh, type of model. Um, beyond that, um, there is a, a, a recommendation around options appraisal, because undoubtedly the one model that's set into the consultation document um, is very narrow in one context that you've only been given that one choice, um, but undoubtedly there are other alternative options that would deliver a national care service with certain functions, as I said, that add value. And these would take place before you leap to a legislative response that um, rips adult social work and adult social care or any other aspects of uh, social work or social care out of local government and put it into a, a, a new structural, um, a new structure, should I say. Um, and uh, within the document, and you'll see echoed in uh, the agreement that COSLA leaders reached last Friday, um, that would remove local democratic accountability for these services, um, a loss of local decision making and um, it goes against the principle of subsidiarity that local government hold very dear, which is that decisions should be taken at the level closest to those who receive those services. So, Chair, I know that seems quite a long ramble, but it's not. It's a very short version of what was a long question um, <coughs> um, that we had on Friday um, that hopefully members uh, found helpful in uh, taking us through the detail. I'll close there and happy to take any comments, um, but uh, subject to the committee's decision today, uh, we will confirm our submission to the uh, National Care Service response. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Colin. Just a couple of uh, comments from myself. Uh, our proposed response to the Scottish Government, I think, has been very well put by yourself today and at the awareness session last week. And I'm hoping that it receives cross-party support uh, from this committee. I think we all want the best care service possible. We recognised national standards. And I think local authorities have a huge part to play in providing that service. Uh, and as you say, our COSLA colleagues of all parties have responded to the National Care Service consultation very much in line uh, with our own proposal. And I think the hope of COSLA is that our collective response will be taken seriously when deliberating on the consultation. 
My hope is that we can put politics aside on this and work together as local authorities to try and achieve the best outcomes for all of our constituents. And I would just open it up now to, to comments from colleagues. Again, as I say, if we can keep it brief, because we do have uh, another committee after this. Thanks very much. Uh, Alec, I see you've got your hand up. Oh, sorry, I wasn't was ready. I thought Joe was in front of us, John. Um, yeah, I do concur uh, with with you in being able to support this uh, paper going going forward. Uh, I don't suppose every single word would be agreeable with everyone, but the general direction, etc., is certainly where we'd want to be. The three key items I would take out of it, and, no, and not in a particular order, but is the funding, subsidiarity, uh, and making sure that what we're doing is the best for our constituents and not just the the best political way, way forward. But what I think we all need to do is we can wring our hands as much as we like at this level, but it's going to be in Holyrood that decisions are taken. And I think we all need to work within our own groups to encourage, and put it in political terms, John, the, op the opposition to be united and getting sufficient traction because there is a, a majority government with a coalition there now and we need to make sure that we do everything in our power to get as many of them on side as we can. The reports you've mentioned, COSLA, our own and SOLAS are very similar, um, slightly different um, interp interpretations. It's hardly surprising that the SOLAS one and our one are so similar, but um, that's by, by the by, the by Cleland. Uh, and I would just finish off by encouraging everyone again to do what we all can within our own groups uh, to get the result that we would be looking for. Thank you. Uh, thank, so, thanks, thanks, Alec. Thank uh, Mark? Thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, yeah, I mean, completely find myself in agreement with Alec there and, and with yourself as well, actually, I want to say, John. Um, I think, like, the Council is certainly on the right track here to, to put across a huge concerns with us. Um, I'm yet to meet anybody that thinks that local flexibility and local decision making are bad things that are weaknesses when it comes to service delivery. And this is probably one of the most important aspects of service delivery that any level of government will give to its citizens and to its residents. Um, if anything, we need, need urgently need more local accountability and decision making uh, and not to decrease it as centralisation of anything inevitably uh, does, even if that centralisation is well intended. Um, I think that we really need to focus urgently on delivering better care and improving capacity for people and that those goals can only suffer if the focus is instead on creating new structures, new bureaucracies and trying to align those to a national <laughs> service based in Edinburgh uh, and rather than councillors in South Lanarkshire and other local, uh, local authorities around the country. Um, and I, I just want to echo a wee bit what Alex said there that I don't want to put politics into this, but having spoken to my group, it's 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 very clear that ultimately, as Alex said, this will not be decided by the opposition parties at Holyrood. The government has an ability to get its agenda through to make these decisions, and I really hope that they will listen, John, to yourselves, to, to your group, and take on board the, the major, major concerns that are shared really across the board locally here. Uh, and I hope you'll have every success in conveying that to them. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, I can only give an assurance that uh, certainly from uh, my own point of view, the comments that you've made will be put forcibly to as many people as we can possibly talk to. Thanks very much. Uh, Joe? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, um, and, and I agree with much of what has been said. I would say that my concern about the, the process, and there is absolutely a compelling need for reform, um, and there is also a compelling need to address the, the point made in Cleland's presentation about um, chronic underfunding of health and social care, um, as well as those issues that we had before the pandemic came, um, a recruitment crisis and uh, that's only gotten worse. I would make the point that there are these immediate challenges and there is a danger that with the focus on structural reform at this time we actually 
shift our focus, indeed the points made in the in the paper, we shift our focus away from those immediate challenges. This morning I was dealing with a case of where social workers are phoning around on an almost daily basis trying to source a care package um, for, a, a, for a constituent of mine and it is just... Um, so far has proven impossible to find the capacity to deliver that care packages. There is, when we talk about unmet need, that's what we mean. There are people out there who need care and are not getting it because of the immediate challenges in in the system that have only been worsened and, and, and exposed and intensified by the, by the pandemic. There are tensions, I think, I've said before in council meetings between the local and the national, and there is a tension um, I would suggest that I would I would certainly like to see address between public and private and the role of market the market and in, in the system. Um, that said, I don't think the submission is is necessarily going to be a a reflection of every dot and comma of one political party's policy. I think what it is is a um, a submission that can reflect those areas where we agree and where we have a strong case to to make. Um, and I would commend. Um, uh, all those involved in drafting the um, uh, Cleland's team, Cleland in particular, and, and all those involved in uh, drafting that submission. As I say, I think it's strong and I think it's compelling. I think that the positive that we can take out of this meeting is that the committee is united behind that submission and in the forceful arguments that we need to make to the to the to the Scottish government. So that's all I have to say, Chair. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joe. Alan. Thanks, Chair. Just a couple of points. First, I'd like to say to Cleland, I thought his two presentations this were very good. My concern is, OK, and a cross-party thing supporting that, but the problem that I see is that we have the Lanarkshire IGIB, which we're full partners in, in which we contribute £600 million. And my kind of, the view I'm getting coming for the IGIB is that they're more in line with that. And just to see Cleland's view on that, it would seem that we'd have two different views coming for Lanarkshire or South Lanarkshire. Thanks, Jim. I think, uh, thanks, Alan. I think we'll probably have a, a number of views coming uh, from different organisations depending on where you sit on the spectrum of what you think the eventual outcome is going to be. But I'll get Cleland to go back on that one. Cleland? Yeah, I think Councillor Faulkner is, is right. There's going to be a lot of different constituent responses. You know, there's going to be uh, there are bodies who make the response. I think Councillor Allison mentioned the, the, the Solace one. There's Social Work Scotland. There's going to be one from the um, Chief officers, etc. The IGIB um, for South Lancers, a, a health and social care partnership, I, I don't know the exact figure, but it's probably got um, something like mid, mid-20s mid in terms of numbers of members on that. We have three, sorry, four voting members as elected members. NHS have four voting members, but there are a lot of individual interests who uh, make up that partnership. So the response that the uh, IGB agreed is much, much more high level um, than, than what you have before you today. And it points to um, areas that they, they, they hope we could get agreement on because there will be different views expressed. Whereas I think, as I've heard today, the parties in South Lancashire Council, while they've dotted the I's and crossed the T's, have a broadly support with um, such a detailed response. But the one that the IGB has put forward is much, much high, higher level and it's on areas that they can get uh, an agreement and consensus on rather than the detail that you've got in the um, presentation before you. But undoubtedly, the Scottish Government will now be dealing with, I would imagine, a, quite a number of hundreds of responses. And um, I believe that they have indicated this morning they're going to appoint an independent party to analyse the responses they receive and prepare a report back for the parliamentary committee. Hopefully that's helpful, Chair. Uh, thanks very much, Cleland. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised uh, on this item, so I'm going to move the recommendation. I'll second, Chair. Thank you very much. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Great. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. We're now going to move into items for noting uh, the first of these is item 10, review of the UK Parliament constituencies, uh, 257 to 260. And if Geraldine can give us a quick report on this, please, thanks. Thank you, Chair. 
<clears throat> this report just advises members of the recent consultation that commenced on the initial proposals of the Boundary Commission for the UK parliamentary constituencies. Um, it was published on the 14th of October and it's, there is an eight-week period for consultation. Currently, the plans, etc., for this are displayed in the libraries and in the council building and also in the Campus Lang Institute. And consultation responses are sought either by email or by post, or you can go onto the online portal and um, submit your responses. What's planned is set out in section three of the report. Now, these are initial proposals. Um, it's currently proposed that the Scottish constituent, uh, constituencies will reduce by two. Section 4.3 sets out what the criteria for each of these constituencies will be. And section 4.4 explains um, what constituencies will now cover the South Lanarkshire Council area. And in Appendix 1, you can see the detail of the relationship between the current and the proposed constituencies and our wards. Um, section 4.5 gives you the impact on existing boundaries um, of these new constituencies if they go through. Now, as I said before, this is an, an initial proposal. You will find that in early 2022, the Boundary Commission will publish the outcome of that and all of the comments received. There may be an opportunity to submit further comments on that. And there are also likely to be a number of public hearings held where people can attend and express their views. The um, revised proposals are likely to be published late 2022 with final recommendations um, round about the summer of 2023. So it is an early stage. Taking you back to the recommendations in the report, um, I'm asking committee to note the consultation has commenced, to note where you can uh, see the various proposals, to note that the consultation closes on the 8th of December and to note the various methods of responding to the consultation. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Geraldine. Uh, does any colleague have questions? I see Richard has his hand up. Richard. Yeah, thanks, John. I, I was hoping maybe some of our um, Clydesdale councillors would maybe come in on this about Kirkluck and Forth being moved into um, a Motherwell constituency. Because um, I think that's not a good move, if I'm honest. I don't know what the other feelings are with the, the local Clydesdale uh, councillors, but certainly I don't think that's a, a good move for us to be part of that other constituency. I don't know what... Um, I'll probably do the online... That, that Geraldine has just mentioned uh, and give my thoughts back on that. But I wanted just to raise that at the meeting, John. Yeah, it has been raised with me as well uh, by some of my own group members. Uh, and I think people are going to reply direct uh, as requested to do so. And I would encourage uh, every councillor uh, who has any concerns about this to, to use those means uh, to make their, their views known. Jim McGuigan. Thanks, Chair. It, uh, we've had uh, comment over the last uh, few months of lack of consultation within South Lanarkshire Council. If they want any example of uh, non-consultation, uh, this is one of the examples that I would actually put up. I have never, in my experience, ever encountered these people to change their minds or for that matter to have taken account of what's being said at any public meeting, any consultation, any submission. And to think of Bob and Uddingston moving in with no disrespect to the people of uh, the Rutherglen area, uh, who I've got great respect for, <laughs> but for Bother and Uddingston has actually got no connection at all to uh, Rutherglen. In fact, it's on the other side of the Clyde. Uh, so, I mean, I, I just, I don't understand it, but I understand from the point of view where it's always been happening. The civil servants sit down with their bits of uh, ruler and their pencils and they just draw lines and they don't give a damn for any community involvement or any community status. Uh, and we get situations where at the moment, I don't know, I haven't seen the map, but on the basis of the, the what I understand at the moment, the this constituency would then run from Kings Park all the way to uh, Bothwell Bridge. 
Uh, that's a hell of a distance. And if we thought that the one which had been cut, Muir, Blackwood, uh, and Lesbian Hegel being involved with the Hamilton Clyde Valley constituency, then this is also a, a, another major one. And again, it goes across two different uh, council authorities. Uh, so it's ludicrous. Uh, and that, uh, that's all I have to say on it. <laughs> Yeah, I can understand, Jim. It does sound as if somebody's sitting down with a ruler and uh, doesn't know the area that they're looking at. However, I think it's still important uh, that if you have any views on it, you should uh, record these views uh, in the hope that somebody does take it nice and slow. Uh, Maureen Devlin. It's basically just, thanks, Chair. It's basically the same as Jim. We have no natural alignment to Rutherford, and it is... Rutherglen and Canberra slang, and it's no disrespect to our colleagues here, and I feel as though we're getting hit by a double whammy again, because when you look at the Scottish parliamentary elections, we're in, Bothell and Addison are stuck in with the North, so most of the stuff all applies to the North, so now what's going to happen is we're going to get stuck in with the likes of with Canberra slang and Rutherglen, and as I say, it's no disrespect. You just feel as though we're stuck in limbo, and there's no, there's nothing in that for either Scottish or the UK government. Thanks. I hear your frustration, Maureen, uh, and it is noted, but as I say, a way to do it to make these uh, views as well, well known as possible. David, David Shearer. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd just like to agree with my constituent. Mr Nelson. Um, yeah, Kirluk and Lanark going in with Motherwell and Wishaw. Part of the Boundary Commission's operating processes are to preserve communities where possible. This, will, this proposal will not preserve communities. It will take us into a situation which Maureen Devlin has highlighted with Bodwell and Uddingston. As you become an orphan, Neither fish nor fowl. You're part of North Lanarkshire, part of South Lanarkshire. You're represented at Parliament differently than you're represented in the Scottish Parliament. So this is going to be confusing enough for elected members, never mind confusing for members of the public. So really, I will be making my views known to the Boundary Commission, but I, I agree with Richard Nelson as this is not going to be beneficial for the communities that it's supposed to be beneficial for. Thank you. Okay, thanks, David. Uh, Kenny? Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm not necessarily speaking in favour of this recommendation, but just a point at the risk of um, disagreeing with my, my colleagues in, in Bothell and Uddingston. We're not that close to Lanark either, which is where we're currently um, aligned with. And Rutherland is probably, is, I would suggest, although I haven't really Put any Google Maps. I think it's much closer than uh, much closer than Lanark. So, just a point. Again, I'll probably make my recommendations on online. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. If uh, colleagues could just remember, this is an item for noting, uh, and we more or less are all uh, agreed in the idea that we're just having a wee rant here. Uh, Alec. Yeah. Well, I've got a question to start with for Cleland. Are we going to be making a response? Clearly. Generally, I would, I would have thought this was for members to make their own because uh, I think Councillor McCree has just given a perfect example of um, it would be terribly difficult to get full consensus around this and I don't think this is one that members would want to be bound by a collective vote. I think it's for members to make their own uh, representations. Thanks. I agree. I would agree. I would agree with that. That's what I thought it would be, but just wanted to be sure. Um, yeah, as Richard has said, the Kirluk Fourth Lanark situation, it's mixing apples and oranges. They've got no connection with the Motherwell at all. One's a rural-based market town constituency, the other is basically urban, and that is where you get a discrepancy. Unfortunately, it's coming up with an alternative because, for, again, without defending them, they have the... Um, role of making all constituencies approximately the same size. So if we're putting forward alternatives, uh, we need to have an alternative. Sorry, if we're objecting, we need to put up alternatives. The size that Jim was talking about, look at DCT. It goes from the far side of Peebles to, do, to Dumfries through three different council areas. So that's not really going to be uh, 
<laughs> a winning uh, profile, Jim. Um, aye, sorry, I've had my rant now. I'm finished. Right. Okay. Listen, listen, folks. Can we try and keep it keep it uh, short, Jim? Uh, John Bradley. Okay, John, I'll just take my hand down. It's just going to be a rant. I'll just uh, say to, <laughs> <laughs> to Jim and Maureen, I'm not, as a member for Camus Lang West, I'm not offended. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK, listen, uh, thanks very much for uh, all those confident rants. Uh, I don't see any more hands raised, uh, so I'm going to move the recommendation. I'll second, Chair. Thank you very much. Have we agreed? Agreed. Thanks very much. Move on now to item 11. Uh, again, another item for noting, programme for government, uh, pages 261 to 308. And if Tom can give us a report on this, please, Tom. Thanks, Chair. I'll keep this quite high level for you. Um, we brought a similar report to the committee last December. Um, what it does is it brings a summary of the key elements that were in the, um, the programme for government that was published by the government, Scottish Government on 11 September. And it also provides an analysis of how the Council's work ties in uh, with that programme. So you won't be surprised to hear the programme sets out recovery from the pandemic as its overarching priority. But under that, there are 69 planned actions sitting under five different themes. And those are laid out for you at 3.1 in the report. That's page 261 of your papers. And you'll see those are establishing a caring nation and society, creating a land of opportunity, securing a net zero nation, creating an economy that works for all Scotland's people and places and living better. Now, section four of the report then sets out how these relate to, to us and local government. And we've drawn on some work done by COSLA to do that. Now, I don't propose to go through that in much detail, but you'll see references throughout section uh, four there to things that are such as health, tackling poverty, improving attainment, uh, climate change, housing, economic recovery, among other elements. So at 4.5, you'll see the programme um, for government also includes the legislative programme for 21-22, and it comprises 12 bills this year, and they're set out for you at 4.5. Now, Section 5, the report turns to the South Lancashire context, and in particular, an exercise that was carried out where the resources, various resources, looked at the various work they're doing and they would consider doing that would uh, help progress along the five themes of the programme for government. Now, that's there for you in as much detail as you like in the appendix, which runs from page 266 to 307. Um, but the recommendations are to note the content of the report and that exec directors will report on relevant aspects and measures through their reports to the relevant committees. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks very much, Tom, for taking us through that uh, fairly speedily. Um, does any... Yep, I see Monique. Monique, you have your hand up. It's a quick one, John. It was just to say... It was under, um, I know the reports at the back of it, it was under 3.1 and it was that to, to secure a net zero nation. It's not to go back over the Hermeyer stuff, it was to raise a point with it. I just feel that, see when the country returns to normal, which it will, and then we've got Hermeyer's train station and it's going to return to race to people get a parking space and there's going to be overflow clogging up, whether it's a hostel car park in the surrounding areas. I think it's relevant to mention at this point that we really do want the 1,200 car parking spaces because we've got a problem with flats in East Kilbride and the surrounding areas. There's no place for them to make their charging points and we're going to have to have charging points so that people can, like, you know, not be able to, you know, charge at their flats, they will at houses eventually. Well, I know some people do it already, but it means that they could then drive their car to the station. That could actually be the charging point. That's where we could make money as a council off it while we're basically promoting green stuff. You know, they would park their car there, then, um, you know, obviously like go on the train and then they'd come back. So we would make money off the car park and we would make um, money off the charging. We'd be encouraging people to be green. So it's just to say, I really want us to really... I know that we have a chance as elected members to influence, um, you know, the officers when they're making operational decisions. So it was just to say that that was something I wanted to try and like for us to push forward for those very reasons. Anyway, thank you very much. For uh, thank, thanks, Monique. Your points uh, well noted. OK, uh, Alec. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, I think the first thing that's glaring in this is how it links in with the red zones in our, uh, in our community planning. 
Um, you could be positive about that and saying they've identified the problems and are looking to see how they can improve them. If I want to be negative, I'll highlight the fact that it's showing up the failures of the past. And Clellan, before you get itchy, I don't mean particularly council um, failures. Drug deaths, that's not, not new. Um, uh, there was another one in, in there. I noticed the child poverty gap has increased um, in in recent years. So whereas they're targeting the right areas, I certainly hope there is is good at implementing policies as there are in being able to identify what was it 69 uh, different bullet bullet points for taking forward. Be negative totally. This is an admittance of defeat uh, of. Failures, sorry. Previous. Uh, 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 thanks, thanks very much, uh, Ali. But without getting political, uh, the Tory government hasn't helped us much either on drugs uh, or in child poverty with some of the actions that have taken recently. So I'm not going to go into politics, but I think you need to realise some of these things are a definite response of the actions of the Westminster government. So let's not go into politics so we can start. No, I, I think I can agree with you, John. It is, uh, it, the, the, there is more, but if you look in Scotland, their drugs death rate is significantly higher than down south. So I think you and also need to take it, take note of the points of where we have a devolved decision making and it has failed. Again, we don't have control of all the things we'd like to do with drugs, Alec. I think you need to take that into consideration as well. However, I'm not going to labour this. We've been uh, over this enough at this present time. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised, so I'm going to move the recommendation. I'll second, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thanks very much. We move on to uh, item 13, which is an item for decision. Uh, it's amendments to membership. Uh, item 12, Chair. Item oh, 12. Sorry about that. I was trying to push it on quickly. Uh, item 12 is the... Um, the local housing strategy. Uh, and Danny, if you could possibly give us a report on this, please. Well, do, Chair, and thanks for your efforts to try to push it on quickly. I'll, I'll, I'll keep the report relatively brief and, and leave it to members to, to come in with any questions. But the purpose of this report really is to update committee on the fourth annual review of the local housing strategy, which covers the period 2017 to 2022. And this annual review covers the period 2019-20 within that. Um, in the report itself, in section four, it notes the range of local and national issues that have changed since the last annual review, and we'll pick them up through specific strategy or plan updates, which are referred to Housing and Technical Resources Committee, and they'll be reported through that route. Um, overall, though, when we did the annual review, it highlighted that despite the impact of the pandemic, on the whole, good progress continued to be made against the nine priority outcomes and the 95 indicators that are contained within the LHS. And of the nine were considered to be complete, 70 were assessed as being green, 10 amber, one red and five will be reported later. And in section five of the report, it provides members with some of the key highlights of the year um, that's just gone by against the five chapters in the LHS, which are housing supply choice and availability, housing quality and energy efficiency, supporting independent living and specialist provision, addressing homelessness and sustainable places. Um, I mentioned earlier there was 10 AMBER measures and these are explained in further detail in paragraph 5.4 and in general you'll note that and members will note that as well that they have stalled as a result of the pandemic um, and the restrictions that were brought in which prevented us from moving these activities forward and what we've noted in the report itself as well is a brief description of how we'll take these actions forward um, over, the, over this year and in and, and the coming years. There is one red measure again which I touched on and that relates to the number of long-term empty properties in South Lancashire and the report itself tries to give a wee bit of context on that and it notes that the level being experienced is around half of the national average so we're just over the 0.8% against the national average is just about double that. The report also details the steps that we're taking to help get these properties back into use and that includes having a dedicated empty homes officer. We've also established a, an officer working group for all the resources across the council who could potentially be involved and the purpose of that is to discuss, discuss and agree the best course of action that we can take collectively in order to try and get the properties back into use. And we've also um, carried out enhancements to our websites as members will have picked up if they've looked at that recently. 
In terms of your caseload, we've currently got 146 empty properties um, on the go, and we've had engagement with 42 owners to start works towards getting the properties back into use. Um, and there's a range of reasons why um, some of these have stalled in getting back into use. And section six of the report, it notes that the same range of, range of measures will be used in this final year of the LHS as it currently stands and for reporting purposes. And in section seven, I think every, every report has covered this already, but it notes the effect of the COVID pandemic and the impacts of this and of Brexit um, will be something we need to keep a close eye on as we go ahead and develop the new strategy in the, the, the months ahead. Finally, in Section 8, it highlights other key areas of works that will be taken forward throughout the course of the year, and I would take members back to the recommendations which they're asked to note the progress in relation to delivery of the LHS priority outcomes in 2019-20. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Danny, for that report. Uh, I see we've got a couple of hands up. Uh, first of all, Joe, uh, and then Josh. Joe? Yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, Danny, briefly, I'm just wondering if you can, you've, you've outlined, I think, Section 7, the impact of COVID. I'm just looking, in terms of our uh, ambition to build 1,000 council homes, I'm just looking as to the impact of Brexit and COVID and those other factors on the, the current house building um, programme and performance against that target. But I'm also aware from, from the report and also from discussions uh, with, with, with leaders on Monday that there's going to be a lag here. So I'm just looking at as we're about to embark on a new uh, LHS uh, and we're about to, um, uh, we're, we're coming to the end of that period in which we were to deliver those thousand homes. I'm just wondering what you can tell us just now about our assumptions for council house building uh, going forward into that next five year period, G I mean, given the given the labour and supply issues that you've, you've mentioned. I think uh, they, clearly we're close to looking at labour and supply issues, um, Councillor Fagan. So what we're looking at just now is um, the impact and, and the, the programmes that have got in place. I think fortunately for us um, that we had procured the, the vast majority of our programmes uh, um, off new new council houses and a lot of these are to put on turnkey developments as well. So whilst the, they've been delayed, the procurement was already underway with them. We, we are suffering a wee bit just with things going back but, but it's by months and it's not um, going to be a significant delay in the programme um, so we still fully expect to deliver our thousand homes as we committed to but they were done by 2022 um, and I'll, I'll provide a further report on that um, probably I was thinking right about as we go back to um, House the Technical Resources Committee in February as part of the budget process um, it will be one of these things that we'll need to continue to look at, the same as the other programmes and works that we've got on board and we discussed earlier as well. We will look at these um, just in terms of deliverability and programming going forward, but we're pretty confident that the supply issues will, will, will bottom themselves out over the, the, the kind of year or, or, or so ahead. Um, and we have got good partnership arrangements in place with a number of other um, house builders and partners and contractors in the area as well. And we will use um, each of the, the procurement routes that are available to us as well to try and make sure that we continue on our journey towards um, increasing the supply of council housing in the area. Uh, Thank thanks you. very much, Danny. Uh, Josh? Yeah. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Danny, for going through that comprehensive report. I, I welcome the report for a number of reasons. I think it outlines well some of the challenges that we've faced that, that Joe highlighted there around supply and demand, but also around the slowdown in throughput to permanent accommodation as a result um, of the pandemic. And it also highlights some of the innovative ways that we've met and overcome those challenges. And obviously, it hasn't been without difficulty but the hard work of staff right across the resort has meant that we've still provided a good service throughout those challenging months to those that require it. One of the, the good examples of that is at 7.1 in the report when it goes through the decision that we took to lease the student accommodation of former UWS student accommodation flats on Almada Street and split them in first stop accommodation for those that presented as homeless and that meant that the throughput the permanent tenancies was offset for folks that were able to receive the, re the support until further accommodation uh, was available. And finally, one of the, the key highlights, I think, throughout the report is, is outlined at 5.3. I think it's particularly welcome to see that through the work of the, the Rapid Rehousing Transition Plan, the resource of reduced long-term homelessness by 41% despite the pandemic. 
uh, across South Planet. I think that's to be commended and welcomed by us all. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks very much, Josh. Yeah, that's to be commended. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands uh, raised on this item, so I'm going to move the recommendation. I'll second, Chair. Thanks very much. Have we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thanks very much, uh, colleagues. Takes us up to now to item 13, which amendments to memberships of committees, forums, and joint boards, uh, page 319 to 324. And can I bring Geraldine on in this one, please? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> The, this report comes about because of recent changes um, to the political composition of the Council as a result of changes in two groups. And uh, the background sets out the rationale behind the changes. Um, and the appendices show you the impact of the changes. Appendix 1 shows you the impact of the changes to the committee memberships and Appendix 2 shows you the impact of the changes to certain outside bodies. Taking you back to the recommendations within the report, um, members are being asked to note the recent changes in the membership of the two groups, uh, the Conservative and Independent groups outlined in paragraph 3.3 .3, to note, to note um, and reflect the current political composition of the Council and as a result of that the amendments to the committee memberships detailed in Appendix 1 be approved and to approve the memberships of the outside board, bodies and joint boards detailed in Appendix 2. In addition to that members are being asked um, to approve that Councillor Razak replaces Councillor Lennon as a member of the Equal Opportunities Forum and that Councillor Lennon fills the resulting vacancy as a substitute member. And finally, that authority is delegated to the Chief Executive in consultation with the leaders of the political groups and the independent members to finalise the memberships as a consequence of the changes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks very much, Geraldine, for that report. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands raised on... Oops, sorry, Monique, your hand's raised. Thanks, John. It's just a quickie. Um, it was just to say, in um, basically the spirit of this report, could we actually, like, like um, the leaders have a chat with Cleland and we could in, in sort something out with regards to meeting times? Because as we've been sitting in this meeting, there's obviously apologies coming in for people that were going to be on the climate committee that now, you know, aren't going to be able to attend because it's nearly an hour and a half late which there's not a problem with this because it's been a good discussion, it's been a good meeting, it's been respectful, so everything's all good. But it's more a case of that, so that that doesn't, we just, we need to think of something when we've got a executive that's got such meaty papers in it, people are going to want to go through the different lines and whatever else. And I just kind of feel as if this is an appropriate time to bring this up so that it's noted and then it means it can be taken forward as an action um, for you lot to discuss at your meeting with Cleland so that it means that when it comes to timetable and then it means that we can work something out so that it means that elected members that would have wanted to have been on committees aren't then disadvantaged because they can't actually be um, on it. Um, and also, I, I will also want to say thank you very much for giving the breaks that you've done. Um, that's very much appreciated as well. Um, but it's just for going forward. We are going to, you know, we did our first meeting at nine o'clock this morning. We're then, it's like one o'clock, you know, the now. And then we're going to begin to another meeting. And it's just like people having the time to, you know, get right. a bite to eat or, eat or anything. Right. Thanks very much, uh, Monique. If you keep going on, it'll be half past one. <laughs> uh, listen, I'll bring Cleland in this uh I don't have any problems with having a look at timetables. Kyle, okay. really, really quickly, uh, you'll recall, Leader, that um, the uh, Standards Procedure and Advisory Forum are looking at uh, a, a review of all procedures, and that includes uh, the Committee Meeting Council. I think the feedback that Councillor McAdams has given us is one that we've had from a number of members, particularly given that the Climate Change Committee follows on from exec, and sometimes the, you have the Council meeting as well. So uh, you've got a meeting of the SPAF, at the end of um, November, I forget the exact date, but we can pick up the point that Councillor McAdams raises there. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I don't see any, any other hands raised, uh, so I'm just going to uh, move the recommendations. I'll second, Chair. Thanks very much. Um, that's the end of the business uh, for this uh, particular meeting. I'm now looking at... Sorry? I'm now looking at uh, my... I watch it's five to one. 
uh, I would imagine that uh, we'll need uh, 10, 10, 10 past one. Half one. Sorry. Sorry, somebody interjected there. Chair, I think oh. someone was saying half past one. I think we're just really conscious now that other people, lots of us will have other meetings and we'll knock right on to the afternoon and it's going to impact on the rest of the day that we're so behind just now. Do you know what I mean? I, uh, I, I mean, I honestly don't mind half one, but that takes us that takes us uh, a lot further into the afternoon. Uh, I, would, I would probably prefer ten past one uh, in the hope that we can get through some of the business of the next meeting as quickly as possible, uh, taking into consideration that other people have meetings further in, into the afternoon. Well, I think you'll meet at this in another day. This kind of just come on like this. We've oh, already wait. done more time for this today. Let us take that to another day. What are, the, what are the views of members? I don't mind taking it to another day if that's the... Uh, if that's the overall view uh, of other members, it's trying to find a date in the diary to do that. Chair, can I make a suggestion? You can make a suggestion, Joe. Right. In, in, in order to be, I'm looking at the agenda for the Climate Change Committee. There are three items for decision and there are four items for noting, and I'm not aware of any urgent business. Can I suggest, as, um, as it frequently happens at the Finance Committee that we uh, agree in the Climate Change Committee to note those items on block unless any member has any issue and would wish to raise them, in which case they can notify you in advance and we deal with the three items for decision. That would be my suggestion as to how to deal with it. If we're not able to do it in a timeous way, given that there are other meetings that will be beginning, um, uh, I'm aware of the Recruitment Committee, for example, weeks later on uh, today, then I, th I think we just have to reschedule for another time altogether. Yeah, I'd be like, I'd be quite happy to take the agenda on that basis, Joe. And hopefully, if we started at something like uh, ten past, we could get through the other three items fairly quickly. How do people feel about that? Agreed. Agreed. So Agreed. We start the meeting Agreed. at ten past, Agreed. and we know the items for noting, and just take the items for decision. Okay. Yeah, Thanks very much, members. Yeah, thank you. See you.